Prologue. Harden. I can't feel the icy concrete under me, or the snow settling over me. I can feel only the hole that was ripped through my chest. I'm kneeling helplessly, watching as Zed pulls out of the parking lot with Tessa in the passenger seat. I couldn't have imagined this, never in my wildest fucking dreams would I have thought that I'd feel this type of pain. The sting of loss, I've heard it called. I haven't had anything or anyone to cherish, never felt the need to have someone to make them completely mine, I haven't wanted to hold on to someone so fiercely. The panic, the complete and utter fucking panic of losing her, wasn't planned. None of this was. It was supposed to be easy, sleep with her, get my money and my bragging rights over Zed. Pretty cut and dried. Only it didn't happen that way. Instead, the blonde-haired girl in the long skirts who obsessively makes long to-do lists crept her way inside of me until, slowly, I fell for her so hard that I couldn't believe it. I didn't realize just how much I loved her until I was vomiting into a sink after showing my fucked up friends the proof of her stolen virginity. I hated it, hated every moment of it, but I didn't stop. I won the bet, but I lost the only thing that has ever made me happy. And along with that, I lost every ounce of goodness she made me see in myself. As the snow soaks into my clothes, I want to blame my father for passing his addiction on to me. I want to blame my mum for staying with him for too long and helping create such a fucked up child. I want to blame Tessa for ever speaking to me. Hell, I want to blame everyone. But I can't. I did this. I ruined her and everything we had. But I'll do whatever it takes to make up for my mistakes. Where is she going now? Is it someplace where I'll ever find her? Chapter 1. Tessa. It took longer than a month, I saw the said finishes explaining how the bed came to be made. I feel sick to my stomach, and I close my eyes to get some relief. I know. He kept coming up with excuses and he kept asking for more time, and he'd lower the amount he was supposed to get. It was weird. We all just thought he was obsessed with winning, like to prove a point or something, but now I get it. Zed stops talking for a second, and his eyes scan my face. It was all he talked about. Then, that day when I invited you to the movies, he flipped out. After he dropped you back off, he totally flipped shit on me and said I had to stay away from you. But I just laughed it off because I thought he was drunk. Did he did he tell you about the stream? And the other stuff? I hold my breath as I ask. The pity in his eyes answers me. Oh my god. I put my hands over my face. He told us everything I mean everything he says in a low voice. I stay quiet and turn off my phone. It hasn't stopped vibrating since I left the bar. He has no right to be calling me. Where's your new dorm? Zed asks, and I notice we're near campus. I don't live in a dorm. Harden and I can barely finish my sentence. He convinced me to move in with him just a week ago. He didn't, Zed gasps. He did. He's so beyond his J just I stutter, unable to come up with a fitting word for his cruelty. I didn't know it was going this far. I thought once we saw the you know, the proof he'd be back to normal, seeing a different girl every night. But then he disappeared. He's barely come around us at all, except the other night he showed up at the docks and was trying to get Jace and me to agree not to tell you. He offered Jace a shitload of money to keep quiet. Money? I say. Harden couldn't be lower. The space inside Zed's truck grows smaller with each sickening revelation. Yeah. Jace laughed it off, of course, and told Harden he would keep his mouth shut. And you didn't? I ask, remembering Harden's busted knuckles and Zed's face. Not exactly I told him that, if he didn't tell you soon, I would. He didn't like that idea, obviously, he says, and waves at his face. If it makes you feel any better, I do think he cares about you. He doesn't. And if he does, it doesn't matter, I say, and lay my head against the window. Every kiss and touch have been shared among Hardin's friends, every moment on display. My most intimate moments. My only intimate moments aren't mine at all. Do you want to come back to my place? I don't mean that in a pushy or creepy way. I just have a couch you could stay on until you figure things out, he offers. No. No, thank you. Can I use your phone, though? 
I need to call Landon. Zed nods at the phone resting on the console, and for a moment my mind wanders to thoughts of how things would be different if I hadn't blown Zed off for Harden after the bonfire. I would never have made all of these mistakes. Landon answers on the second ring, and just like I knew he would, he tells me to come right over. Granted, I haven't told him what's up, but he's just so kind. I give Zed Landon's address, and he stays quiet for most of the drive across town. He's so going to come after me for taking you anywhere but. To him, he finally says. I would apologize for being in the middle of this, but you guys, did this to yourselves, I say honestly. I do pity Zed slightly, because I believe he had much better intentions than Hardin did, but my wounds are too fresh to even think about that right now. I know. If you need anything, call me, he offers, and I nod, before climbing out of the car. I can see my breath coming out in front of my face in hot spurts through the cold air. I can't feel the cold, though. I can't feel anything. Landon is my only friend, but he lives at Hardin's father's house. The irony of this is not lost on me. It's really coming down out there, Landon says as he rushes me inside. Where's your coat? He scolds playfully, then flinches when I step into the light. What happened? What did he do? My eyes scan the room, hoping that Ken and Karen aren't downstairs. That obvious, huh? I wipe under my eyes. Landon pulls me into his arms, and I wipe my eyes again. I no longer have the strength physical or emotional, to sob. I'm beyond that, so far beyond it. Landon gets me a glass of water and says, go up to your room. I manage to smile, but some perverse instinct leads me to Hardin's door, when I reach the top of the stairs. When I realize it, the pain that is so close to breaking back through stirs even more forcefully, so I quickly turn and go into the room across the hall. Memories of running across the hall to Hardin, that night I heard him screaming and his sleep burn within me as I opened the door. I sit awkwardly on the bed in my room, unsure what to do next. Landon joins me a few minutes later. Sitting next to me, he's close enough to show concern, yet far enough to be respectful, as is his way. Do you want to talk about it? He asks kindly. I nod. Even though repeating the whole saga hurts worse than finding out about it in the first place, telling Landon feels almost liberating. And it's a comfort to know that at least one person didn't actually know about my humiliation the entire time. Listening to me, Landon is as still as stone, to the point that I can't read what he's thinking. I want to know what this makes him think of his stepbrother. Of me. But when I finish, he immediately jumps up with an angry energy. I can't believe him. What the hell is wrong with him? Here I thought he was becoming almost decent and he does, this, this is so messed up. I can't believe he would do this to you, of all people. Why would he ruin the only thing he has? As soon as Landon finishes speaking, his head snaps to the side. And then I too, notice it, footsteps rushing up the staircase. Not just footsteps, but heavy boots slamming against the wooden steps in a frenzy. He's here, we both say, and for a split second I actually consider hiding in the closet. Landon looks at me with a very adult seriousness on his face. Do you want to see him? I shake my head frantically, and Landon moves to close the door just as Hardin's voice slices right through me. Tessa. Just as Landon reaches out his arm, Hardin bursts through the doorway and blows past him. He stops in the middle of the room, and I stand up off the bed. Not used to this sort of thing, Landon stands there, stunned for a moment. Tessa, thank God. Thank God you're here. He sighs and runs his hands over his hair. My chest aches at the sight of him, and I look away, focusing on the wall. Tessa, baby. I need you to listen to me. Please, just I stay silent, and walk toward him. His eyes light with hope, and he reaches out for me, but when I continue past him, I catch the hope extinguishing in him. Good. Talk to me, he begs but I shake my head and stand next to Landon. No, I'll never be talking to you again. I shout. You don't mean that Hardin steps closer. Get away from me. I scream as he grabs my arm. Landon steps between us and puts his arm on his stepbrother's shoulder. Hardin, you need to go. Hardin's jaw clenches and he looks back and forth between us. Landon, 
You need to get the fuck out of the way, he warns. But Landon stands his ground, and I know Hardin well enough to know that he's weighing his options, whether it's worth punching Landon right now, in front of me. Seeming to have decided against it, he takes a deep breath. Please give us a minute, he says, trying to keep his calm. Landon looks at me, and my eyes plead with him. He turns back to Hardin. She doesn't want to talk to you. Don't you fucking tell me what she wants. Hardin screams and his fist connects with the wall, cracking and denting the drywall. I jump back and begin to cry again. Not now, not now, I silently repeat to try to manage my emotions. Go, Hardin. Landon shouts just as Ken and Karen appear at the doorway. Oh no. I shouldn't have come here. What the hell is going on? Ken asks. No one says anything. Karen looks at me with sympathy, and Ken repeats his question. Hardin glares at his father. I'm trying to talk to Tessa, and Landon won't mind his own damn business. Ken looks at Landon, then at me. What did you do, Hardin? His tone has changed from worried to angry. I can't quite put my finger on it. Nothing. Fuck. Hardin throws his hands in the air. He messed everything up, is what he did, and now Tessa has nowhere to go, Landon states. I want to speak, I just have no idea what to say. She has somewhere to go, she can go home. Where she belongs with me, Hardin says. Hardin has been playing Tessa this entire time, he did unspeakable things to her. Landon blurts out, and Karen lets out a gasp, stepping over to me. I utterly shrink. I've never felt so naked and small. I didn't want Ken and Karen to know, but it may not make much of a difference, since after tonight they surely won't really want to see me again. Do you want to go with him? Ken asks, interrupting my downward spiral. I shake my head meekly. Well, I'm not leaving here without you, Hardin snaps. He steps toward me, but I cringe away. I think you need to go, Hardin, Ken surprises me by saying. Excuse me? Hardin's face is a deep shade of red that expresses what I can only describe as rage. You're lucky I even come here to your house, and you dare to kick me out? I've been very happy with how our relationship has grown, son, but tonight you have to go. Hardin throws his hands into the air. This is bullshit, who is she to you? Ken turns to me, then back to his son. Whatever you did to her, I hope it was worth losing the only good thing you had going for you, he says and then drops his head. I don't know if it was the shock of Ken's words, or just that he'd hit a point where all the rage peaked and flowed out of him, but Hardin just stills, looks at me briefly, and marches out of the room. We all remain quiet while we listen to him walk down the stairs at a steady pace. When the sound of the front door slamming cuts through the now quiet house, I turn to Ken and sob, I'm so sorry. I'll go. I didn't mean for any of this to happen. No, you stay as long as you need. You're always welcome here, Ken says, and both he and Karen hug me. I didn't mean to come between you, I say, feeling terrible for the way Ken had to kick his son out. Karen grabs hold of my hand and gives it a squeeze. Ken looks at me with exasperation and weariness. Tessa, I love Hardin, but I think we both know that without you. There isn't anything to come between, he says. Chapter 2. Tessa. I stayed in, as long as I could, letting the water roll over me. I wanted it to clean me, reassure me somehow. But the hot shower didn't help me relax like I had hoped. I can't think of anything that's going to calm the ache inside of me. It feels infinite. Permanent. Like an organism that's come to live within me, but also like a whole growing steadily larger. I feel terrible about the wall. I offered to pay for it, but Ken refuses to let me, I tell Landon as I brush out my wet hair. Don't worry about that. You have a lot going on. Landon frowns and rubs his hand across my back. I can't comprehend how my life came to this, how I ever got to this point. I stare ahead, not wanting to meet my best friend's eyes. Three months ago, everything made sense. I had Noah who would never do something like this. I was close with my mother, and I had this idea of how my life would be. And now I have nothing. Literally nothing. I don't even know if I should go to my internship anymore, because Hardin will either go there, or he'll convince Christian Benz to fire me, 
just because he can. I grab the pillow on the bed and grip the material hard in my fist. He had nothing to lose, but I did. I let him take everything from me. My life before him was so simple and decided. Now after him it's just after. Landon looks at me with wide eyes. Tessa, you can't give up your internship. He's taken enough from you. Don't let him take that please, he practically pleads. The good thing about this afterlife without him is that you can make it whatever you please, you can start all over. I know he's right, but it isn't that simple. Everything in my life is tied to Harden now, even the paint on my damn car. He somehow became the string that held everything in my life together, and in his absence I'm left with the rubble that once was my life. When I relent and give Landon a half-hearted nod, he smiles a little and says, I'll let you get some rest. He hugs me and starts to leave. Do you think this will ever stop? I ask, and he turns around. What? My voice almost a whisper, the pain? I don't know I'd like to think it will, though. Time heals most wounds, he answers and gives me his most comforting half-smile, half-frown. I don't know if time will heal me or not. But I do know that if it doesn't, I won't survive. With heavy-handed intent, yet enacted with his unfailing politeness, Landon forces me out of bed the next morning to make sure I don't miss my internship. I take a moment to leave a note of thanks to Ken and Karen, and to apologize again for the whole heart input in their wall. Landon is quiet and keeps looking over at me as he drives, trying to give me encouraging smiles and little slogans to remember. But I still feel terrible. Memories begin to creep into my mind as we pull into the parking lot. Harden on his knees in the snow. Zed's explanation of the bet. I quickly unlock my car, jumping inside to get away from the cold air. When I get into my car, I cringe at my reflection in the rear view. My eyes are still bloodshot and rimmed with dark circles. Bags have swollen up under them, completing the horror movie look. I will definitely need more makeup than I thought. Going to Walmart the only nearby store open at this hour, I buy everything I need to mask my feelings. But I don't have the strength or the energy to make a real effort on my appearance, so I'm not sure I look much better. Case in point, I arrive at Vance, and Kimberly gasps when she sees me. I try to muster a smile for her, but she jumps up from her desk. Tessa, dear, are you okay? She asks frantically. Do I look that bad? I shrug weakly. No, of course not, she lies. You just look exhausted. Because I am. Finals took a lot out of me, I tell her. She nods and smiles warmly, but I can feel her eyes on my back the entire walk down the hall to my office. After that, my day drags on, no end in sight, it seems, until late morning, when Mr. Vance knocks at my door. Good afternoon, Tessa, he says with a smile. Good afternoon, I manage. I just wanted to touch base with you and let you know how impressed I am with your work so far. He chuckles. You're doing a better and more detailed job than many of my actual employees. Thank you, that means a lot to me, I say, and immediately the voice in my head reminds me that I only have this internship because of Hardin. That being the case, I would like to invite you to the Seattle conference this coming weekend. Often these things are pretty boring but it's all about digital publishing, the wave of the future and all that. You'll meet a lot of people, learn some things. I'm opening a second branch in Seattle in a few months, and I need to meet a few people myself. He laughs. So what do you say? All expenses would be paid, and we'll leave Friday afternoon. Hardin is more than welcome to come along. Not to the conference but to Seattle, he explains with a knowing smile. If only he really knew what was going on. Of course I would love to go. I really appreciate your invitation. I tell him, unable to contain my enthusiasm and the immediate relief that, finally, something decent is happening to me. Great. I'll have Kimberly give you all the details and explain how to expense things he rambles on, but I wander off while he does. The idea of going to the conference soothes my ache slightly. I will be farther away from Hardin, but on the other hand, Seattle now reminds me of when Hardin wanted to take me there. He has tainted every aspect of my life, including the entire state of Washington. I feel my office getting smaller, the air in the room getting thicker. Are you feeling okay? 
Mr. Vance asks, his brow lowers in concern. Uh, yeah, I just I haven't eaten today and I didn't sleep much last night I tell him. Go ahead and go home, then, you can finish what you're doing at home he says. It's okay no, go on home. There are no ambulances in publishing. We'll manage without you he assures me with a wave, then strolls off. I gather my things, check my appearance in the bathroom mirror, yup, still pretty horrible, and I'm about to step into the elevator, when Kimberly calls my name. Going home, she asks and I nod. Well, Hardin's in a bad mood, so beware. What? How do you know? Because he just cussed me out for not transferring him to you. She smiles. Not even the tenth time he called. I figured if you wanted to talk to him, you would have on your cell. Thank you, I say, silently grateful she's as observant as she is. Hearing Hardin's voice on the line would have made the aching hole in me grow that much more quickly. I managed to make it to my car before breaking down again. The pain only seems to get worse when there are no distractions, when I'm left alone with my thoughts and memories. And, of course, when I see the 15 missed calls from Hardin on my phone and a notice that I have 10 new messages, which I won't read. After pulling myself together enough to drive, I do what I've been dreading to do, call my mother. She answers on the first ring. Hello? Mom, I sob. The word feels odd coming out of my mouth, but I need the comfort of my mom right now. What did he do? The this has been everyone's reaction shows me just how obvious the danger of Hardin was to everyone and how oblivious I've been. I he I can't form a sentence. Can I come home just for today? I ask her. Of course, Tessa. I'll see you in two hours, she says and hangs up. Better than I thought, but not as warm as I had hoped for. I wish you were more like Karen, loving and accepting of any flaw. I wish she could just soften up, just long enough for me to feel the solace of having a mother, a loving and comforting one. Pulling onto the highway, I shut my phone off before I do something stupid, like read any of those messages from Hardin. Chapter 3. Tessa. The drive to my childhood home is familiar and easy, requiring little thought on my part. I force myself to let out every scream, literally, as in screaming as loud as I possibly can, and until my throat is sore, before I arrive in my hometown. I find this is actually much harder to do than I thought it would be, especially since I don't feel like yelling. I feel like crying and disappearing. I would give anything to rewind my life to my first day of college, I would have taken my mother's advice and changed rooms. My mother had worried about Steph being a bad influence, if only we'd realized it would be the rude, curly-haired boy that would be the problem. But he would take everything in me, and spin it around, tearing me into tiny pieces, before blowing on the pile, and scattering me across the sky, and beneath his friend's heels. I have only been two hours away from home this whole time, but with everything that's happened, it feels so much farther. I haven't been home, since I started school. If I hadn't broken up with Noah, I would have been back many times. I force my eyes to stay focused on the road as I pass his house. I pull into our driveway and practically jump out of my car. But when I get to the door, I'm not sure if I should knock. It feels strange to do so, but I don't feel comfortable just walking inside either. How can so much have changed since I left for college? I decide to just walk inside, and I find my mother standing by the brown leather couch in full makeup, a dress, and heels. Everything looks the same, clean and perfectly organized. The only difference is that it seems smaller, maybe because of my time at Ken's house. Well, my mother's house is definitely small and unappealing from the outside, but the inside is decorated nicely, and my mother always did her best to mask the chaos of her marriage with attractive paint and flowers and attention to cleanliness. A decorating strategy she continued after my dad left, because I guess it had become habit by that point. The house is warm, and the familiar smell of cinnamon fills my nostrils. My mother has always obsessed over wax burners and has one in every room. I take my shoes off at the door, knowing that she won't want snow on her polished hardwood floors. Would you like some coffee, Teresa? She asks before hugging me. I get my coffee addiction from my mother, and this connection brings a small smile to my lips. Yes, please. 
I follow her into the kitchen and sit at the small table, unsure how to begin the conversation. So are you going to tell me what happened? She asks bluntly. I take a deep breath in the sip of my coffee before answering. Hardin and I broke up. Her expression is neutral. Why? Well, he didn't turn out to be who I thought he was, I say. I wrap my hands around the scalding hot cup of coffee in an attempt to distract myself from the pain and prepare myself for my mother's response. And who did you think he was? Someone who loved me. I'm not sure who I thought Hardin was other than that, on his own, as a person. And now you don't think he does? No, I know he doesn't. What makes you so sure, she asks coolly. Because I trusted him, and he betrayed me, in a terrible way. I know I'm leaving out the details, but I still feel the strange need to protect Hardin from my mother's judgment. I scold myself for being so stupid, for even considering him, when he clearly wouldn't do the same for me. Don't you think you should have thought about this possibility before deciding to live with him? Yes, I know. Go ahead and tell me how stupid I am. Tell me that you told me so, I say. I did tell you, I warn you about guys like him. Men like him and your father are best to stay away from. I'm just glad it's over with before it really even began. People make mistakes, Tessa. She takes a drink from her mug, leaving a pink lipstick ring. I'm sure he'll forgive you. Who? Noah, of course. How does she not get this? I just need to talk to her, to have her comfort me, not push me to be with Noah again. I stand up, looking at her, then around the room. Is she serious? She can't be. Just because things didn't work out with Hardin, doesn't mean I'm going to date Noah again. I snap. Why doesn't it? Tessa, you should be grateful that he's willing to give you another chance. What? Why can't you just stop? I don't need to be with anyone right now, especially not Noah. I want to rip my hair out. Or hers. What do you mean, especially not Noah? How can you say that about him? He's been nothing but great to you since you were kids. I sigh and sit back down. I know, mother, I care about Noah so much. Just not in that way. You don't even know what you're talking about. She stands up and pours her coffee down the drain. It's not always about love, Teresa. It's about stability and security. I'm only 18, I tell her. I don't want to think that I'd be with someone without loving them just for the stability. I want to be my own stability and security. I want someone to love, and someone to love me. Almost 19. And if you aren't careful now, no one will want you. Now go fix your makeup, because no will be here any minute, she announces and walks out of the kitchen. I should have known better than to come here for comfort. I would have been better off sleeping in my car all day. As promised, no arrives five minutes later, not that I've bothered to fix my appearance. Seeing him walk into the small kitchen makes me feel even lower than I have so far, which I didn't think was possible. He smiles his warm perfect smile. Hey. Hey, Noah, I respond. He walks closer, and I stand up to hug him. He feels warm, and his sweatshirt smells so good, just like I remember. Your mom called me, he says. I know. I try to smile. I'm sorry that she keeps bringing you into this. I don't know what her problem is. I do. She wants you to be happy, he says, defending her. No, I warn. She just doesn't know what really makes you happy. She wants it to be me, even though it's not. He gives a little shrug. I'm sorry. Tess, stop apologizing. I just want to make sure you're okay, he assures me, and hugs me again. I'm not, I admit. I can tell. Do you want to talk about it? I don't know, are you sure that's okay? I can't bear to hurt him again by talking about the guy I left him for. Yeah, I'm sure, he says and pours himself a glass of water before sitting across from me at the table. Okay I say and tell him basically everything. I leave out the sex details, since those are private. Well, they aren't. But to me they are. I still can't believe that Hardin told his friends everything that we did that's the worst part. Even worse than showing the sheets is the fact that after telling me that he loved me and making love 
he could apparently turn around and make a mockery of what had happened between us in front of everyone. I knew he was going to hurt you, I just had no idea how bad Noah says. I can tell how angry he is, it's strange to see this emotion on his face, given how calm and collected he normally is. You're too good for him Tessa, he's scum. I can't believe how stupid I was I gave up everything for him. But the worst feeling in the world is loving someone who doesn't love you. Noah grabs his glass and twists it in his hands. Tell me about it he says softly. I want to smack myself for saying what I just said, saying it to him. I open my mouth, but he cuts me off before I can apologize. It's okay, he says and reaches out to rub his thumb over my hand. God, I wish I did love Noah. I would be much happier with him, and he would never do something like Hardin did to me. Noah catches me up on everything I've missed since I left, which isn't much. He's going to go San Francisco for college instead of WCU, which I find I'm grateful for. At least one good thing came out of my hurting him, it gave him the push he needed to get out of Washington. He tells me about what he's researched on California, and by the time he leaves, the sun has fallen, and I realize that my mom has stayed in her room during his whole visit. Stepping out to the backyard, I wander to the greenhouse, where I spend most of my childhood. As I stare through my reflection in the glass and into the little structure, I see that all its plants and flowers are dead, and it's generally a mess, which feels fitting at the moment. I have so many things to do, to figure out. I need to find somewhere to live and find a way to get all of my stuff from Hardin's apartment. I was seriously considering just leaving everything there, but I can't. I have no clothes except the ones I've been keeping there, and, most importantly, I need my textbooks. Reaching into my pocket, I turn my phone on, and within seconds my inbox is full, and the voicemail symbol appears. I ignore the voicemails and quickly scan the messages, only looking at the sender. All except one are from Hardin. Kimberly wrote me, Christian said to tell you to stay home tomorrow, everyone will be leaving at noon anyway since the first floor needs to be repainted, so stay home. Let me know, if you need anything. XX. Having the day off tomorrow, is a huge relief. I love my internship, but I'm beginning to think I should transfer out of WCU, maybe even leave Washington. The campus isn't big enough for me to be able to avoid Hardin and all of his friends, and I don't want the constant reminder of what I had with Hardin. Well, what I thought I had. By the time I go back inside the house, my hands and face are numb from the cold. My mother is sitting in a chair reading a magazine. Can I stay tonight? I ask her. She looks at me briefly. Yes. And tomorrow we'll figure out how to get you back into the dorms, she says and goes back to her magazine. Figuring I'll get no more from my mother tonight. I go up to my old room, which is exactly the way that I left it. She hasn't changed a thing. I don't bother removing my makeup before bed. It's hard, but I force myself to sleep, dreaming of when my life was much better. Before I met Hardin. My phone rings in the middle of the night, waking me. But I ignore it, briefly wondering if Hardin's able to sleep at all. The next morning all my mother says to me, before leaving for work is that she'll call the school and force them to let me back into the dorms, in a different building far from my old one. I leave, intending to head to campus, but then decide to go to the apartment, taking the exit to the road, that leads there and driving quickly, to keep from changing my mind. At the complex, I scan the parking lot for Hardin's car, twice. Once I'm sure he isn't around, I park and hurry across the snowy lot to the door. By the time I get to the lobby, the bottoms of my jeans, are soaked and I'm freezing. I try to think of anything except Hardin, but it's impossible. Hardin must have really hated me to go to this extreme to ruin my life, and then to move me into an apartment far from anyone I know. He must be pretty proud of himself right now for causing me this much pain. As I fumble with my keys before unlocking the door to our place a tidal wave of panic crashes over me, nearly knocking me the ground. When will it stop? or at least decrease. I go straight to the bedroom and grab my bags from the closet, roughly shoving all my clothes in them without care. My eyes flicker to the bedside table, where a small frame stands, displaying the picture of Hardin and me smiling together before Ken's wedding. 
Too bad it was all fake. Leaning across the bed, I grab it and throw it against the concrete floor. It shatters into pieces and I jump over the bed, grab the photo, and rip it into as many pieces as I can, not realizing that I'm sobbing until I choke on my own breath. I grab my books, piling them into an empty box, and, instinctively, Hardin's copy of Wuthering Heights, he won't miss it, and, honestly, I'm owed it, after what he's taken from me. My throat is sore, so I go into the kitchen and grab a glass of water. I sit down at the table and allow myself a few minutes to pretend that none of this has happened. To pretend that instead of my having to face the future days alone, Hardin will be home from class shortly and will smile at me and tell me he loves me, that he missed me all day. That he will lift me onto the counter and kiss me with longing and love, the clicking of the door startles me out of my pathetic daydream. I jump to my feet as Hardin walks through the door. He doesn't see me, since he's looking over his shoulder. At a brunette in a black sweater dress. So this is it he begins, and then stops when he notices my bags on the ground. I'm frozen as his eyes travel around the apartment, and then over to the kitchen, where they widen in shock at seeing me. Tess, he says, as if he's not sure that I actually exist. Chapter 4. Tessa. I look like hell. I'm in baggy jeans and a sweatshirt, yesterday's smeared makeup, and tangled hair. I look at the girl standing behind him. Her curly brown hair is silky and cascades in loose waves down her back. Her makeup is light and perfect, but then, she's one of those women who doesn't need it to begin with. Of course she is. This is humiliating, and I wish I could sink into the floor, disappearing out of the beautiful girl's sight. When I reach down to pick one of my bags up off the floor, Hardin seems to remember the girl is there and turns around to face her. Tessa, what are you doing here, he asks. As I wipe at the makeup around my eyes, he asks his new girl, can you give us a minute? She looks at me, then nods and goes back into the building hallway. I can't believe you're here, he says and walks into the kitchen. He removes his jacket, which makes his plain white t-shirt right up and reveal the tan skin of his torso. The ink there, the twisted angry branches of the dead tree on his stomach, taunt me. Calling out to be touched. I love that tattoo, it's my favorite that he has. Only now I see the parallel between him and the tree. Both unfeeling. Both alone. At least the tree has hope to bloom again. Hardin does not. I, I was just leaving. I managed to say. He looks so perfect, so beautiful such a beautiful disaster. Please just let me explain myself, he begs, and I notice the dark circles under his eyes are even more prominent than mine. No. I reach for my bags again, but he grabs them from me and drops them back onto the floor. Two minutes, that's all I'm asking for, Tess. Two minutes is too long to be here with Hardin, but this is the closure I know I need in order to move on with my life. I sigh and sit down, trying to hold back any noise that would betray my neutral expression. Hardin is clearly surprised, but quickly takes the seat across from me. You sure moved on fast, I say quietly, lifting my chin toward the door. What? Hardin says, then seems to remember the brunette. She works with me. Her husband is downstairs with their newborn daughter. They're looking for a new place, so she wanted to see her the layout. You're moving? I ask. No, not if you'll stay, but I don't see the point in staying here without you. I'm just going over my options here. Something in me is slightly relieved, but then immediately a more defensive part of me notes that just because he isn't sleeping with a brunette doesn't mean he won't be sleeping with someone else soon. I ignore the twinge of sorrow that comes along with Hardin talking about moving out, even though I won't be here when he does. Do you think I would bring someone back here to our apartment? It's only been two days, is that how you think of me? He has some nerve. Yes. Of course it is, now. When I nod viciously at this, pain flashes across his face. But after a moment he just sighs in defeat. Where did you stay last night? I went to my father's and you weren't there. My mother's. Oh. He looks down at his hands. Did you guys work everything out? I stare directly into his eyes. I can't believe he has the nerve to ask me about my family. That's no longer any of your business. 
He starts to reach out to me, but stops. I miss you so much, Tessa. I lose my breath again, but remember how good he is at twisting things around. I turn away. Sure you do. Despite the whirlwind of my emotions, I won't allow myself to come undone any further in front of him. I do, Tessa. I know I fucked up big time, but I love you. I need you. Just stop, Harden. Save yourself the time and energy. You aren't fooling me, not anymore. You got what you wanted, so why not just stop? Because I can't. He reaches for my hand, but I jerk away. I love you. I need you to give me a chance to make this up to you. I need you, Tessa. I need you. Do you need me too? No, I don't actually. I was fine before you came into my life. Fine isn't happy, he says. Happy? I scoff. And what, am I happy now? How dare he try to claim he makes me happy. But he did make me happy. So happy, once. You can't sit here, and tell me, that you don't believe, that I love you. I know you don't, it was all a game to you. While I was falling in love with you, you were using me. His eyes well up with tears. Let me prove to you, that I love you please. I'll do anything, Tessa. Anything. You've already proved enough to me, Hardin. The only reason I'm even sitting here right now is because I owe it to myself to listen to what you have to say, so I can move on with my life. I don't want you to move on, he says. I let out a harsh breath. This isn't about what you want. This is about how you hurt me. His voice sounds small, and cracks. You said you'd never leave me. I don't trust myself when he's like this. I hate the way his pain rules me making me irrational. I said I wouldn't leave you, if you didn't give me a reason to. But you did. Now it makes perfect sense to me, why he was always worried about me leaving. I thought it was his own paranoia about being. Good for me, but I was wrong. So wrong. He knew once I found out I would run. I should be running right now. I made excuses for him, because of the things he went through as a child, but now I'm beginning to wonder, if he was lying about that too. About all of it. I can't do this anymore. I trusted you. Harden, I trusted you with every fiber of my being, I depended on you, I loved you, and you were using me all along. Do you have any idea, how that makes me feel? That everyone around me was mocking me, and laughing behind my back, including you, the person I trusted the most. I know, Tessa, I know. I can't begin to tell you how sorry I am. I don't know what the fuck was wrong with me, when I brought up the bed in the first place. I thought it would be easy his hands shake as he pleads with me. I thought you would sleep with me, and that would be the end of it. But you were so headstrong, and so intriguing, that I found myself thinking of you constantly. I would sit in my room and try to plot ways, that I could see you, even if it was just to fight with you. I knew it wasn't just a bed anymore after that day at the stream, but I couldn't bring myself to admit it. I was battling with myself, and I was worried about my reputation, I know that's fucked up, but I'm trying to be honest. And when I told everyone about the things we did, I didn't tell them, what we were actually doing I couldn't do that to you, even in the beginning. I would just make up shit, that didn't actually happen, and they bought it. A few tears fall from my eyes, and he reaches across to wipe them. I don't move away fast enough, and his touch burns my skin. It takes everything in me to not lean into his palm. I hate to see you this way, he mutters. I close my eyes and reopen them, desperate for the tears to stop. I stay quiet as he continues, I swear, I started telling Nate and Logan about the stream, but I found myself getting irritated, jealous even, over the idea of them knowing what I did with you, how I made you feel, so I told them, that you gave me well, I just made shit up. I know that I'm lying about what we did is no better than telling them the truth, not really. But for some reason I feel some relief, that Hardin and I are the only people who really know what happened between us, the real details of our moments together. Which isn't good enough. And then again, he's probably lying right now, I can never tell, and here I am already quick to believe him. What the hell is wrong with me? Even if I believed you, I can't forgive you, I say. I blink away my tears, and he puts his head in his hands. You don't love me, he asks, looking at me between his fingers. Yes. 
I do, I admit. The truth of my confession weighs heavily between us. He lowers his hands, staring at me in a way that makes me regret my admission. It's true, though. I love him. I love him too much. Then why can't you forgive me? Because this is unforgivable, you didn't just lie. You took my virginity to win a bet, and then showed people my blood on the sheets. How could anyone forgive that? He drops his hands and his bright green eyes look desperate. I took your virginity, because I love you, he says, which only makes me shake my head vigorously, so he continues. I don't know who I am without you anymore. I look away. This wasn't going to work anyway, we both know that, I tell him to make myself feel better. It's hard to sit across from him and watch him in pain, but at the same time my sense of justice means the seeing him in pain eases mine somewhat. Why wouldn't it work? We were doing great, everything we had was based on a lie, Hardin. And because his pain has given me a sudden feeling of confidence, I say, besides, look at you and look at me. I don't mean it, but the look on his face when I use his biggest insecurity about our relationship against him, though it kills something inside me, also reminds me that he deserves it. He's always been worried about how we look together, that I'm too good for him. And now I've thrown it in his face. Is this about Noah? Do you saw him, didn't you? Hardin asks and my mouth falls open at his audacity. His eyes shine with tears and I have to remind myself that he did this. He ruined everything. Yes, I did, but that has nothing to do with it. That's your problem, you go around doing whatever the hell you want to people, not caring about the outcome, and you expect everyone to just be okay with it. I shout and stand up from the table. No, I don't, Tessa, he yells, and I roll my eyes. At that, he pauses, then stands and looks out the window, then back at me. Okay, yes, so maybe I do. But I really do care about you. Well, you should have thought about that when you were bragging about your conquest, I say steadily. My conquest? Are you fucking serious right now? Do you earn some conquest of mine? You're everything to me. You're my breath, my pain, my heart, my life. He takes a step toward me. What makes me the saddest is that these are the most touching words that Hardin has ever said to me, but he's screaming them. Well, it's a little too late for that. I scream back. Do you think you can just, he catches me off guard by wrapping his hand around the back of my neck and pulling me to him, crashing his lips to mine. The familiar warmth of his mouth nearly brings me to my knees. My tongue is moving along with his before my mind catches up to what's happening. He moans in relief and I try to push him away. He grabs my wrists in one hand and holds them on his chest as he continues to kiss me. I keep struggling to get out of his grip but my mouth continues to move along with his. He backs up and pulls me with him until he's against the counter and his other hand reaches out to the side of my neck, holding me still. All of the pain and heartache inside me begin to dissolve and I relax my hands in his. This is wrong but so right. But wrong. I pull away and he tries to reconnect our lips, but I turn my head. No, I say. His eyes soften. Please he begs. No, Hardin. I need to go. He lets go of my wrists. Go where? I, I don't know yet. My mother is trying to get me back into a dorm. No no he shakes his head, his voice becoming frantic. Do you live here, don't go back into the dorms. He runs his hands through his hair. If anyone should, it's me. Just please stay here, so I know where you are. You don't need to know where I am. Stay, he repeats. If I'm being completely honest with myself, I want to stay with him. I want to tell him that I love him more than I want to breathe, but I can't. I refuse to get pulled back in and be that girl who lets guys do whatever the hell they want to her. I pick up my bags and say the only thing that will keep him from following. Noah and my mother are waiting. I have to go. I lie and walk out of the door. He doesn't follow and I don't let myself turn around to see the pain he's in. Chapter 5. Tessa. When I get to my car I don't cry like I had assumed I would. I just sit and stare out the window. The snow sticks to my windshield, blanketing me inside. The wind around the car is chaotic, picking up the snow and swirling it, completely sheltering me. 
with each flake of snow coating the glass, a barrier between the harsh reality and the car is formed. I can't believe that Hardin came to the apartment while I was there. I had hoped to not see him. It did help, though, not the pain, but the situation in general. At least now I can try to move on from this disastrous time in my life. I want to believe him and that he does love me, but I got into the situation by believing him. He could just be acting like this because he knows he doesn't have control over me anymore. Even if he does love me, what would that change? It wouldn't take back everything he did, it wouldn't take back all the jokes, the terrible bragging about the things we did, or the lies. I wish I could afford that apartment on my own, I would stay there and make hard and leave. I don't want to go back to the dorms and get a new roommate, I don't want a community shower. Why did it all have to start with a lie? If we'd met in some different way, we could be inside that apartment right now, laughing on the couch or kissing in the bedroom. Instead, I'm in my car alone with nowhere to go. When I finally start the car, my hands are frozen. Couldn't I be homeless in the summer? I feel like Catherine again, only not my usual Wuthering Heights Catherine. This time Catherine in Northanger Abbey is who I relate to, shocked and forced to make a long journey alone. Granted, I'm not making a 70-mile journey from Northanger after being dismissed and embarrassed, but still, I feel her pain. I can't decide who Hardin would be in this version of the book. On one hand, he's like Henry, smart and witty, with a knowledge of novels as great as mine. However, Henry is much kinder than Hardin, and that's where Hardin is more like John, arrogant and rude. As I drive through town with nowhere to go, I realize that Hardin's words had a bigger impact on me than I would like to admit. Him begging me to stay almost put the pieces back together, just to break them again. I'm sure he only wanted me to stay to prove that he could. It's not like he started calling and texting again, since I drove away. I force myself to drive to campus and take my last final before winter break. I feel so detached during the exam, and it feels impossible that everyone on campus could be so clueless about what I'm going through. A fake smile and small talk can hide the splitting pain, I suppose. I call my mother to check on the status of getting into a new dorm, only to have her mumble no luck and quickly hang up the phone. After driving aimlessly for a bit, I find myself a block away from Vance and realize it's already five in the evening. I don't want to take advantage of Landon by asking him to stay at Ken's house again. I know he wouldn't mind, but it's not fair of me to put Hardin's family in the middle of this, and honestly that house holds too many memories. I couldn't stand it. I pass a street lined with motels and pull into the lot of one of the nicer looking ones. I suddenly realize that I've never actually stayed at a motel before, but it's not like I have anywhere else to go. The short man behind the counter looks friendly enough as he smiles at me and asks for my driver's license. A few short minutes later he's handing me a key card and a slip of paper with a Wi-Fi code. Getting a room is much easier than I thought it would be a little expensive, but I don't want to stay someplace cheap and risk my safety. Down the sidewalk and make a left he informs me with a smile. I thank him and head back out into the blistering cold and move my car to the spot next to my room so I don't have to carry my bags. This is what I've come to because of that thoughtless egotistical boy. I am someone staying in a motel, alone, all my belongings stuffed frantically into bags. I am someone who has no one to lean on instead of someone who always had a plan. Grabbing some of my bags, I lock my car, which looks like junk compared to the BMW next to me. Just as I think my day could not get any worse, I lose my grip on one of my bags and drop it onto the snowy sidewalk. My clothes and a few books topple out onto the wet snow. I scramble to pick them up with my free hand, but I'm afraid to see which books they are, I don't think I can take my favorite possessions being ruined alongside me, not today. Here let me help you, miss, a man's voice says as a hand reaches down to help me. Tessa? Shocked, I look up to see blue eyes and a concerned face. Trevor? I say even though I know it's him. I stand upright and look around. What are you doing here? I'd ask you the same thing. He smiles. Well I might take my bottom lip between my teeth. But he saves me from having to explain myself. My plumbing went haywire 
So here I am. Bending down, he gathers some of my stuff and hands me a silk copy of Wuthering Heights with a raise of his brow. Then he hands me a couple of wet sweaters in Pride and Prejudice, saying ruefully, here this one's in bad shape. And like that, I know the universe is playing a sick joke on me. I somehow knew you would be into the classics, he tells me with a friendly smile. He takes the bags from me, and I give him a nod of thanks, before sliding in the key card and opening the door. The room is freezing, so I go over to the heater immediately, and turn it all the way up. You would think for how much they charge here they wouldn't worry about their electric bill, Trevor says and sets my bags on the floor. I smile and nod in agreement. I grab the clothes that fell onto the snow and put them over the shower curtain rod. When I come back into the main room, there's an awkward silence with this person I barely know in this room that isn't really mine. Is your apartment nearby? I ask to bring some life into the space. House. But yeah, it's only about a mile away. I like to be close to work, so I know I won't ever be late. That's a good idea it sounds like something I would do. Trevor looks so different in casual clothes. I have only ever seen him in suits, but here he's wearing snug blue jeans and a red sweatshirt, with his hair messy, where it's usually perfectly gelled. I think so too. So are you alone? He asks and looks at the ground, obviously uncomfortable prying. Yeah. I'm alone. I mean that in more ways than he knows. I'm not trying to be nosy, I was just asking, because your boyfriend doesn't seem to like me much. He half laughs and wipes his black hair from his forehead. Oh, Hardin doesn't like anyone, don't take it personally. I pick up my nails. He isn't my boyfriend, though. Oh, sorry. I just assumed he was. He was sort of. Was he? He said he was. But then, Hardin said a lot of things. Oh, sorry again. I just keep saying all the wrong things. He laughs. It's okay. I don't mind, I tell him, and unpack the rest of my bags. Do you want me to go? I don't mean to intrude. He half turns toward the door, as if to show his offer is genuine. No, no, you can stay. If you want, of course. You don't have to, I say too quickly. What is wrong with me? It's settled, then, I'll stay, he says and sits down on the chair next to the desk. I look for a place to sit myself, and eventually decide on the edge of the bed. I'm pretty far away from him, which makes me realize how spacious the room really is. So, how are you liking Van so far, he asks, his fingers tracing patterns on the wooden desk. I love it. It's so much more than I ever expected. It's literally my dream job. I hope to get hired on after I graduate. Oh, I think you'll be offered a position there well before then. Christian is very fond of you, that manuscript you turned in last week was all I heard about at lunch the other day. He says you have a good eye, and from him, that's a huge compliment. Really? He said that? I can't help but smile. The action feels odd and unwelcome, but also comforting all at once. Yeah, why else would he invite you to the conference? Only the four of us are going. Four of us? I ask. Yeah. Me, you, Christian, and Kim. Oh, I didn't know Kim was going. I hope desperately that Mr. Vance didn't only invite me because he feels obligated due to my relationship with Hardin, his best friend's son. He wouldn't be able to go a weekend without her, Trevor teases. Because of her office management skills, of course. I give a little smile. I can see that. So why are you going? I ask and then mentally slap myself. I mean why are you going? since you work in finance, don't you? I try to clarify. No, I get it, you bookies don't need a human calculator around. He rolls his eyes, and I laugh, really laugh. He's opening a second office in Seattle shortly, and we're going to a meeting with a potential investor. Also, we'll be scouting locations, so he needs me to make sure we get a good deal, and Kimberly to make sure, whatever building we like functions with our workflow. Are you into real estate too? The room is finally warm, so I take my shoes off and tuck my feet underneath me. No, not at all, but I'm good with numbers, he brags. It'll be a good time, though. Seattle is a beautiful city. Have you been? Yeah, 
it's is my favorite city. Not that I have a lot to choose from me either. I'm from Ohio, so I haven't seen much. Compared to Ohio, Seattle is like New York City. I find myself genuinely interested in knowing more about Trevor. What made you come to Washington? Well, my mother passed away my senior year of high school, and I just had to go. There's just so much more to see, you know? So I promised her, right before she died, that I wouldn't spend my life in that dreadful town where we lived. The day I got accepted to WCU was the best and worst day of my life. Worst? I ask. She passed away that same day. Ironic, isn't it? He gives a wan smile. The way only half of his mouth turns up is lovely. I'm sorry. No, don't be. She was one of those people that didn't belong here with the rest of us. She was too good, you know? My family got to have more time with her than we deserved, and I wouldn't change a thing, he says. He gives me full smile and gestures at me. What about you? Are you going to stay here forever? No, I always wanted to move to Seattle. But lately I've been thinking of going even further, I admit. You should. You should travel and see everything you possibly can. A woman like you shouldn't be kept in a box. He must notice a mod look on my face, because he quickly says, sorry I just mean you could do so much. You have a lot of talents, I can tell. But I wasn't bothered by what he said. Something about the way he called me a woman makes me happy. In my life, I've always felt like a child, because everyone treats me like one. Trevor is only a friend, a new friend, but I'm really glad to have his company on this terrible day. Have you had dinner? I ask. Not yet. I was debating whether or not to order a pizza, so I don't have to go back into that blizzard. He laughs. We could split one? I offer. Deal, he says, with the kindest look I've seen in a long time. Chapter 6. Harden. My father has the stupidest expression on his face. It always happens when he tries to look authoritative, like now, with his arms crossed as he stands filling his front doorway. She isn't going to come here, Harden, she knows you'll find her. I fight the urge to knock his teeth down his throat. Instead, I rake my fingers through my hair, flinching slightly when my knuckles twinge. The cuts are deeper than usual this time. Punching the drywall did more damage to my hands than I thought. It's nothing compared to how I feel inside. I never knew this type of pain existed. It's so much worse than any physical pain I could cause myself. Son, I really think you should give her some space. Who the fuck does he think he is? Space? She doesn't need space. She needs to come home. I yell. The old woman next door turns to look at us, and I raise my arms at her. Please don't be rude to my neighbors, my dad warns me. Then tell your neighbors to mind their own damn business. I'm sure the old gray hair heard that. Goodbye, Hardin, my father says with a sigh and closes the door. Fuck. I yell and pace back and forth on the porch a few times before finally going back out to my car. Where the hell is she? As mad as I am, I'm worried as hell about her. Is she alone, or afraid? Oh course. Knowing Tessa, she isn't afraid at all. She's probably going over the reasons she hates me. Actually, she's probably writing them down. Her need to be in control of everything, and her stupid lists used to drive me crazy, but now I long to see her scribbling the most irrelevant things. I would give anything to watch her chew on her full bottom lip in concentration, or see that adorable scowl take over her sweet face, even one more time. Now that she's with Noah and her mother, the small chance I thought I had is gone. Once she's reminded why he's better for her than me, she'll be his again. I call her again, but her phone goes straight to voicemail for the twentieth time. God damn it, I'm such a fucking idiot. After driving around for an hour to every library, every bookstore, I decide to go back to the apartment. Maybe she'll show up, maybe she'll show up I know she won't. But what if she does? I need to clean up the huge mess I made and buy some new dishes to replace the ones that I smashed against the walls, just in case she comes home. A man's voice booms through the air and vibrates my bones, where are you, Scott? I saw him leave the bar. I know he's here, another man says. The floor is cold when I climb out of bed. 
At first I thought it was daddy and his friends, but now I don't think it is. Come out, come out wherever you are, the deepest voice yells, and there's a massive crash. He isn't here, my mummy says as I reach the bottom of the stairs and can see everyone. My mum and four men. Oh, look what we have here, the taller man says. Who knew Scott had such a bangin' wife? He grabs my mum by the arm and pulls her off the couch. She grabs at her shirt desperately. Please he isn't here. If he owes you money, I'll give you all I have. You can take anything in the house, the television maybe, but the man only sneers at her. A television? I don't want a damn television. I watch her struggle to shake free of him, almost like a fish I caught once. I have some jewelry, not much, but please, shut the fuck up, another man says and smacks her. Mum. I yell and run into the living room. Harding go upstairs, she shouts, but I'm not leaving my mummy with these bad men. Get out of here, you little shit, one of them tells me, pushing me so I land hard on my butt. See, bitch, the problem is that your husband did this, he snarls, pointing to his head, where I see a massive gash across his bald scalp. And since he isn't here, the only thing we want is you. He smiles, and she kicks her legs at him. Harden, baby, go upstairs now, she yells. Wait, why is she mad at me? I think he wants to watch, the injured man says and pushes her onto the couch. I jolt awake and sit up. Fuck. They keep coming, every night worse than the last. I got so used to them not coming, that I could sleep. Because of her, it was all because of her. But here I am at four in the damn morning with bloody sheets from my busted knuckles, and a killer headache from my nightmares. I close my eyes and try to pretend she's really here, and hope that sleep will come. Chapter 7. Tessa. Tess, baby, wake up. Harden whispers as he touches his lips to the soft skin just under my ear. You look so beautiful when you're waking up. I smile, pulling him by his hair to meet my eyes. I brush my nose against his, and he chuckles. I love you, he says and presses his lips to mine. Only I can't feel them. Harden? I question. Harden? But he fades from my side, I snap my eyes open, and am thrown back into reality. The strange room is pitch black, and for a second I forget where I am. And then it comes to me, a motel room. Alone. I grab my phone off the bedside table, and see it's only 4 a.m. I wipe the tears from the corners of my eyes and close my eyes, to try to get back to Harden, even if it's only in a dream. When I finally wake up again, it's 7. I step into the shower and try to enjoy the hot water as it relaxes me. I blow dry my hair and do my makeup. Today is the first day I feel like looking decent. I need to get rid of this mess that's inside of me. Not knowing what else to do, I take a page from my mother's book and paint a perfect face on in order to bury what's inside. When I'm finished, I look well rested somehow and actually really nice. I curl my hair and dig my white dress out of my bag and cringe. Good thing this room has an iron. It's cold, too cold for this dress which doesn't quite reach my knees, but I won't be outside long. I choose some plain black flats and set them on the bed with a dress. Before I get dressed, I repack my bags so they're more orderly. I hope my mother calls with some good news about the dorms. If not, I'll have to stay here until she does, which will drain what little money I have and fast. Maybe I should just look into getting my own place. I might be able to afford something small close to Vance. I open the door, to find the snow mostly melted under the morning sun. Thank goodness. Just as I unlock my car door, Trevor walks out of his room two doors down from mine. He's wearing a black suit and a green tie, he looks so put together. Good morning. I would've helped you get those, you know, he says when he sees I'm carrying my bags. Last night, after we ate pizza. We watched a little television and shared stories of college. He had a lot more stories than me since he's already graduated, and while I really enjoyed hearing about what my college experience could have, and should have, been like, it made me a little sad too. I shouldn't have been going to parties with people like Hardin. I should have found myself a small but true group of friends. It would have been so different, so much better. Did you sleep well? He asks and pulls a set of keys out of his pocket. 
With a click, the BMW engine starts. Of course, the BMW is his. Your car starts itself? I laugh. He holds up his key. Well, this thing starts it. Nice. I smile a little sarcastically. Convenient, he counters. Extravagant? A little. He laughs. But still very convenient. You look lovely today, as usual. I put my bags in the back of my car. Thank you, it's freezing out, I say and get into the driver's seat. See you at work, Tessa. He says and climbs into his BMW. Despite the sun, it's still cold, so I quickly thrust my key into the ignition and turn it to start up the heater. Click 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 is my car's only response. Frowning, I try again and get the same thing. Can I get a freaking break? I say aloud and hit my palms against the steering wheel. For a third time I try to start my car, but of course nothing happens, not even the clicking this time. I look over, thankful that Trevor's still here. His window rolls down, and I can't help but laugh at my own misfortune. Do you think you could give me a ride? I ask and he nods. Of course. I think I know where you're going he laughs, and I climb out of my car. I can't help but turn my phone on during the short drive to Vance. Surprisingly, I have no new texts from Hardin. I have a few voicemails, but I don't know if they're from him or my mother. Choosing not to listen to them just in case, I instead text my mother and ask her about the dorms. Trevor drops me off at the door, so I don't have to walk in the cold, which is really thoughtful of him. You look refreshed, Kimberly says with a smile as I walk in and grab a donut. I feel a little better. Sort of, I say and pour myself a cup of coffee. Are you ready for tomorrow? I can't wait to get out of here for the weekend, Seattle has amazing shopping, and while Mr. Vance and Trevor have their meetings we'll find some fun stuff to do. Is um have you talked to Hardin? It takes me a second, but I decide to tell her. She'll probably find out anyway. No. Actually, I moved my stuff out yesterday, I say and she frowns. I'm sorry, girl. It'll get easier as time goes by. God, I hope she's right. My day goes faster than expected, and I finish this week's manuscript early. I'm excited to go to Seattle, and I hope that I can get my mind off Hardin, even if it's only for a little bit. Monday is my birthday, which I'm not looking forward to it at all. If things hadn't gone downhill so quickly, I'd be on my way to England with Hardin on Tuesday. I don't really want to spend Christmas with my mother either. Hopefully I'll be back in the dorms by then, even if they'll basically be empty, and then maybe I can think of a good enough reason to not show at my mother's. I know it's Christmas, and that's terrible of me, but I'm not exactly in a holiday mood. My mother texts me as my day is winding down, saying that she hasn't heard back about the dorm. Great. At least I only have one more night until the Seattle trip. Shuffling around from place to place is not fun at all. As I'm getting ready to leave for the day, I remember I didn't drive to work myself. I hope Trevor hasn't already left. See you tomorrow, we'll meet here, and Christian's driver will take us to Seattle, Kimberly tells me. Mr. Vance has a driver? Of course he does. When I step off the elevator, Trevor is sitting on one of the black couches in the lobby, the contrast of the black couch, black suit, and his blue eyes is very appealing. I wasn't sure if you needed a ride or not, and I didn't want to bother you in your office, he tells me. Thank you, I really appreciate it. I'm going to call someone about my car when I get back to the motel. It's slightly warmer than it was this morning, but still freezing outside. I can wait with you if you want. My plumbing is fixed now, so I won't be staying at the motel again, but I'll wait with you if you. He stops talking suddenly, and his eyes go wide. What? I ask and follow his eyes, to see Hardin standing by his car in the lot, and staring angrily at Trevor and me. The breath has been knocked out of me once again. How does it keep getting worse? Hardin, what are you doing here? I ask, storming toward him. Well, you don't answer my calls, so I didn't have much of a choice, did I? He says. I didn't answer for a reason. You can't just show up to my job. I yell back. Trevor looks uncomfortable and intimidated by Hardin's presence, but he stays next to me. Are you okay? 
Let me know if you're ready. Ready for what? Hardin's eyes are wild. He's taking me back to the motel since my car wouldn't start. Motel. Hardin raises his voice. Before I can stop him, Hardin has his hands on Trevor, gripping the collar of his suit as he slams him against a red truck. Hardin. Stop. Let him go. We didn't stay together. I explain. Why I'm explaining myself to him is beyond me, but I don't want him to hurt Trevor. Hardin lets go of Trevor's clothing, but stays in his face. Back off of him, now. I grab Hardin's shoulder, and he relaxes slightly. Stay away from her, he spits, his face only inches from Trevor's. Trevor looks pale, and once again I've brought someone else into this mess, that doesn't deserve to be. I'm so sorry, I tell Trevor. It's okay, do you still need a ride, he asks. No, she doesn't, Hardin answers for me. Yes please, I say to Trevor. I just need a minute. Like the gentleman that he is, he nods and goes over to his car to give us space. Chapter 8. Tessa. I can't believe you're staying at a motel. He runs his hand over his hair. Yeah, neither can I. You can stay at the apartment, I'll stay back at the frat house or something. No. Not happening. Please don't be difficult. He rubs his hand across his forehead. Difficult? You aren't serious. I shouldn't even be talking to you right now. Would you just calm down? Now, what's wrong with your car? And why was that guy staying at the motel? I don't know what's wrong with my car. I groan. I'm not answering him about Trevor, it's none of his business. I'll take a look at it. No, I'll call someone. Just go. I'll follow you to the motel. He nods toward the road. Would you just stop? I growl and Hardin rolls his eyes. Is this some sort of game to you, to see just how far you can push me? He takes a step back, as if I pushed him. Trevor's car is still here, waiting for me. No, that's not what I'm doing. How could you even think that, after everything I've done? Exactly, I do think that, because of everything you've done, I say, almost laughing at his choice of words. I just want you to talk to me. I know we can work this out, he tells me. He's played so many games with me since the beginning, that I can't tell what's real. I know you miss me too, Hardin says, leaning against his car. His words stop me in my tracks. So arrogant. Is that what you want to hear? That I miss you? Of course I miss you, but you know what? It's not actually you that I miss, it's who I thought you were, and now that I know who you really are, I want nothing to do with you. I yell. You've always known who I really am. I've been me all along, you know that, he shouts back. Why can't we ever just talk without yelling at each other? He makes me crazy, that's why. No, I don't know that. If I knew that I, I stop myself before I admit that I want to forgive him. What I want to do and what I know I should do are two totally different things. Do what, he asks. Of course he would try and coerce me to continue. Nothing, you need to go. Tess, you don't know what it's been like the last few days for me. I can't sleep, I can't even function without you. I need to know there's a chance we could, I interrupt him, before he can finish. What it's been like for you. How can he be so selfish? What do you think it's been like for me, Hardin? Imagine how it feels to have your life completely ripped apart within hours. Imagine how it feels to be so in love with someone that you give them everything, only to find out it was all a game, a bet. How do you think that feels? I take a step toward him, my hands moving frantically between us. How do you think it feels to lose my relationship with my mother over someone who could give less of a shit about me? How do you think it feels to be staying in a goddamn motel room? How do you think, if it feels to try to move on from this, when you keep showing up everywhere? You just don't know when to stop. He doesn't say anything, so I continue my rant. Part of me feels like I'm being too harsh on him, but he betrayed me in the worst way and he deserves it. So don't you sit here and tell me that it's been hard for you because you did this. You fucking ruined everything. Just like you always do, so you know what? I don't feel sorry for you actually I do. I feel sorry for you because you will never be happy. You will be alone for the rest of your life and for that I feel sorry for you. 
I'll move on, find a nice man who will treat me the way you should have, and we'll get married and have children. I will be happy. I'm out of breath after my long speech, and Hardin is looking at me with red eyes and an open mouth. You know the worst part of all of this? It's that you warned me, you said you would ruin me, and I didn't listen. I try desperately to stop my tears, but I can't. They fall mercilessly down my face, and my mascara runs, burning my eyes. I'm I'm sorry. I'll go, he says in a low voice. He looks completely and utterly defeated, the way I wanted him to look, but it doesn't give me the satisfaction that I thought it would. I maybe could have forgiven him in the beginning, if he'd have told me the truth, even after we slept together, but instead he hid it from me, offered people money for their silence, and tried to trap me by making me sign the lease with him. My first time being intimate with someone is something I will never forget, and he's ruined that. I rush over to Trevor's car and jump inside. The heat is on, blasting at my face, mixing with my hot tears. Trevor stays quiet, and I'm thankful yet again for his silence as he drives me to the motel. By the time the sun goes down, I force myself to take a hot shower, too hot. The look on Hardin's face as he backed away from me and got into his car is etched in the back of my mind. I see his face every time I close my eyes. My phone hasn't rung one since he left. I had the silly, naive idea that we could work. That despite our differences and his temper well, both of our tempers we could make it work somehow. I'm not sure how I managed to fall asleep, but I do. The next morning I'm a little anxious about going on my first business trip and begin to panic. Plus I forgot to get someone to fix my car. I look up the nearest mechanic and call them. I'll probably have to pay them extra to keep my car for the weekend, but that's the least of my worries right now. I don't mention it to the friendly man who answers in the hopes they just won't bother charging me for it. I get myself ready, curling my hair and putting on more makeup than usual. I choose a navy blue dress that I haven't worn yet, something I bought, because I knew Hardin would love the way the thin material hung on my curves. The dress itself isn't revealing at all. The hem reaches just below my knees, and the sleeves go halfway down my arm. But the way it fits makes it look really good on me. I hate that everything makes me think of him. As I stand in front of the mirror, I imagine how he would be looking at me in this dress, the way his pupils would dilate, and he'd lick his lips, before pulling his lip ring between his teeth, while he watched me adjust my hair one last time. A knock on the door brings me back to reality. Ms. Young? A man in a blue mechanic's uniform asks when I open the door. That's me, I say and pull open my purse to grab the keys. Here, it's the white Corolla, I say as I hand them to him. He looks behind him. Why Corolla? He asks, confused. I step outside. My car is gone. What the okay, let me call the front desk and see if they had my car towed for leaving it here yesterday. What a great way to start my day. Hello, this is Tessa Young, room 36, I say when the front desk guy answers. I think you have my car towed. I'm trying to be nice, but this is really frustrating. No, I didn't, he replies. My head is spinning. Okay, well then, my car must have been stolen, or something if someone took my car, I am beyond screwed. It's almost time for me to leave. No, your friend came and got it this morning. My friend? Yeah, the one with all the tattoos and stuff. He says it quietly, as if Harding could actually hear him. What? I know what he said, but that's all I can think to say. Yeah, he came with a tow truck this morning about two hours ago, he says. Sorry, I thought you knew, thanks. I groan and hang up. Turning to the man before me, I say, I am so sorry. Apparently someone has already had my car taken to another mechanic. I didn't know. I'm sorry for wasting your time. He smiles and assures me that it's okay. After my fight with Hardin yesterday, it slipped my mind that I needed a ride to work today. I call Trevor to let him know, and he tells me that he already asked Mr. Vance and Kimberly to swing by and pick me up on their way. After thanking him, I hang up and pull back the curtain on the window. A black car pulls into the lot and stops in front of my room. The window rolls down, and I see Kimberly's blonde hair. Good morning. 
We're here to save you, she announces with a laugh, when I open the door. Smart and kind Trevor, always thinking ahead. The driver gets out and with the tip of his cap grabs my bag and stashes it in the trunk for me. When he opens the back door, I see two seats that face each other. On one, Kimberly pats the leather, inviting me to sit next to her. On the other, Mr. Vance and Trevor look at me with amused expressions. Ready for your weekend getaway? Trevor asks with a wide smile. More than you can imagine, I reply and get into the car. Chapter 9. Tessa. As we pull out onto the highway, Trevor and Mr. Vance return to what appears to be a deep conversation about price per square foot on a new building in Seattle. Kimberly nudges me with her elbow and then mimics their talking with her hand. Those boys are so serious, she says. So, Trevor said something happened to your car? Yeah. I have no idea what, I say, trying to keep a light tone, which is easier with Kimberly's friendly smile. It wouldn't start yesterday, so I called someone to fix it. But Hardin already had someone come get it. She smirks. Persistent, isn't he? I sigh. I guess so. I just wish he would give me a little time to process all of this. Process what? She asks. I forget that she doesn't know about the bet, my humiliation, and I certainly don't want to tell her. She only knows that Hardin and I broke up. I don't know, just everything. I have so much going on right now, and I still don't have anywhere to live. I feel like he isn't taking this as seriously as he should. He thinks he can just play puppeteer with me in my life. He thinks he can just show up and say sorry and all will be forgiven, but that's not how it works. Not anymore at least, I huff. Well, good for you. I'm happy you're standing up for yourself, she says. I'm just glad she isn't asking for details. Thank you. Me too. I really am proud of myself for standing up to Hardin and not just giving in but at the same time I feel terrible for what I said to him yesterday. I know he deserved it, but I can't help but think, what if he does care as much as he claims? But even if somewhere deep down he does, I just don't think it's enough to ensure he doesn't hurt me again. Because that's what he does, he hurts people. Changing the subject, Kimberly says excitedly, we should go out tonight right after the last talk. On Sunday those two will be in meetings all morning. So we'll do some shopping then. We'll go out tonight, and maybe Saturday night too. What do you think? Go out where? I laugh. I'm only 18. Oh please. Christian knows a lot of people in Seattle. If you're with him, you can get in anywhere. I love the way her eyes light up when she speaks of Mr. Vance, even though he's already right next to her. Okay, I say. I've never been out before. I've been to the few parties at the frat house, but I haven't ever been to a nightclub or anything even close. It'll be fun, don't worry, she assures me. And you should definitely wear that dress, she adds with a laugh. Chapter 10. Hardin. You will be alone for the rest of your life, and for that I feel sorry for you. I'll move on, find a nice man who will treat me the way you should have, and we'll get married and have children. I will be happy. Tessa's words keep playing over and over in my head. I know she's right, but I so desperately don't want her to be. I had never minded, being alone until now, now I know what I'm missing. Do you in? Jace's voice breaks through my muddled thoughts. Uh, what? I ask. I almost forgot that I was driving. He rolls his eyes and takes a hit from his joint. I asked if you were in. We're going to Zed's. I groan. I don't know why not. You need to stop being such a pussy. You're moping around like a fucking baby. I glare at him. If I had gotten any sleep last night, I'd reach across and choke him. I am not, I say slowly. You so are, dude. You need to get wasted and laid tonight. I'm sure there'll be some easy girls there. I don't need to get laid. I don't want anyone but her. Well, come on, drive over to Zed's. If you don't want to get laid, then at least come, have a few beers, he says. Don't you ever want to do more? I ask and he looks over at me like I've grown horns. What? Do you know, doesn't it feel like it's getting old just partying and hooking up with different girls all the time? Whoa, whoa, this is worse than I thought. You got it bad, man. 
No, I don't. I'm just saying. Doing the same old shit all the time gets old. He doesn't know how enjoyable it is to lie in bed and make Tessa laugh. He doesn't know how fun it is to hear her ramble on about her favorite novels, to have her swat at me when I try to grope her. It's much better than any party that I've ever been to or will ever go to. She really did a number on you. That's some shit, isn't it? He laughs. No, she didn't, I lie. Sure he throws the remainder of his joint out of my car window. She's single, though, right? He asks, and when I grip the wheel he laughs even harder. I'm just fucking around, Scott. Just wanted to see how pissed you would get. Fuck off, I grumble, and to prove a point, I turn on the back road to Zed's. Chapter 11. Tessa. The Four Seasons in Seattle is the nicest hotel I have ever seen. I try to walk slowly to take in all the beautiful details, but Kimberly practically drags me onto the elevator and down the hall, leaving Trevor and Mr. Vance in her wake. Stopping in front of a door, she says, here's your room. After you unpack, we'll meet in our suite to go over the itinerary for the weekend, even though I already know you've already done this. You should change, because I really think you should save that dress for tonight when we go out. She winks and strolls off down the hall. The differences between my hotel from the last two nights in this one are vast. One painting from the lobby here probably costs more than what they spent decorating an entire room at the other place. The view from my window is incredible. Seattle is such a beautiful city. I can easily imagine myself living here, in a high-rise apartment with a job at Seattle Publishing, or even Vance Publishing, now that they're opening an office here. That would be amazing. After I hang up my clothes for the weekend, I change into a black pencil skirt and a lilac shirt. I'm excited about the conference, but nervous about going out. I know I need to have some fun, but it's all new to me, and I still feel empty from the damage Hardin has caused. By the time I get to Kimberly and Mr. Vance's suite, it's 2.30. I'm anxious because I know we should be downstairs in the banquet room by 3. Kimberly greets me warmly when she opens the door and leads me inside. Their suite has its own living room and a separate sitting room. It looks bigger than my mother's entire house. This is wow, I say. Mr. Vance laughs and pours himself a glass of what looks like water. It's okay. We ordered some room service so we can all eat a little something before we head downstairs. It should be here any minute, Kimberly says, and I smile and thank her. I didn't realize how hungry I was until she mentioned food. I haven't eaten at all today. Do you ready to be bored out of your mind? Trevor asks as he appears from the sitting room. It won't be boring to me. I smile and he laughs. I may not want to leave this place, I add. Me either, he admits. Same, Kim says. Mr. Vance shakes his head. That could be arranged, love. He puts his hand on her back, and I look away from the intimate gesture. We should just bring the main office here and all move. Kimberly jokes. At least I think she's joking. Smith would love Seattle. Mr. Vance says. Smith? I ask, then I remember his son from the wedding and blush. Sorry, your son, of course. It's okay, it's an odd name, I know. He laughs and leans into Kimberly. It must be so nice to be in a loving, trusting relationship. I envy Kimberly this, a shameful envy, but envy nonetheless. She has a man in her life who obviously cares for her and would do anything to make her happy. She's so lucky. I smile. It's a lovely name. After eating, we head downstairs, and I'm thrown into a large conference room full of people who love books. It's heaven. Network. Network. Network, Mr. Van says. It's all about networking. And for the next three hours he introduces me to almost every single person in the room. The best part is that he doesn't introduce me as his intern, and he treats me like an adult. They all do. Chapter 12. Harden. Well well well, look who it is, Molly says and rolls her eyes, when Jason and I walk into Zed's apartment. Drunk and pregnant already? I say to her. So? It's past five, she says with an evil grin. I shake my head at her right as she says, have a shot with me, Harden, and grabs a bottle of brown liquor and two shot glasses off the counter. Fine. 
one, I say, and she smiles, before filling up the small glasses. Ten minutes later, I find myself looking through the photo gallery on my phone. I wish I'd have let Tessa take more pictures of us together, so I would have more to look at now. God, I do have it bad, like Jay said. I feel like I'm slowly losing my mind, and the most fucked up part is, I don't care how crazy I'm being as long as it helps me get closer to her again. I will be happy, she said. I know I didn't make her happy, but I could. At the same time, it isn't fair for me to keep bothering her. I got her car fixed, because I didn't want her to have to worry about doing it herself. I'm glad that I did, because I wouldn't have known she was going to Seattle if I hadn't called Vance to make sure she'd have a ride to work. Why wouldn't she tell me? That prick Trevor is with her right now when I should be. I know he likes her, and I could see her falling for him. He's exactly what she needs, and they're a lot alike. Unlike her and I. He could make her happy. The thought pisses me off, and makes me want to slam his head through a window, but maybe I need to give her space, and give her a chance to be happy. She made it clear yesterday, that she can't forgive me. Molly. I call from the couch. What? Bring me another shot. And even without looking at her, I can feel her Victoria smile fill the room. Chapter 13. Tessa. That was so amazing. Thank you so much for bringing me along. I'm practically gushing at Mr. Vance as we all step into the elevator. It was my pleasure really, you're one of my best employees. Intern or not, you're very bright. And please, for the love of God, call me Christian, like I told you already, he says with a fake gruffness. Yes, okay. This was beyond incredible, Mr. Christian. It was great hearing everybody talk about their thoughts on digital publishing, especially since it will only continue to grow, and is so convenient and easy for readers. This is huge, and the market just keeps expanding I ramble. True, true. And tonight we help Vance Publishing grow a little more, imagine how many new customers we'll get when we fully optimized our operations, he agrees. Okay, are you two done? Kimberly teases and wraps her arm through Christians. Let's get changed, and hit the town. This is the first weekend in months, that we've had a sitter. She pouts playfully. He smiles down at her. Yes, ma'am. I'm glad that after his wife passed away Mr. Vance, I mean Christian, got a second chance at happiness. I look over at Trevor, and he gives me a small smile. I need a drink, Kimberly says. Me too, Christian says. Okay, so everyone meet in the lobby in 30 minutes, and the driver will pick us up out front. Dinner is on me. When I get back to my room, I plug in my curling iron, so I can touch up my hair. I brush dark powder over my eyelids and look in the mirror. The powder looks heavy for me, but not too heavy. I line my eyes with black liner and add some blush to my cheeks before fixing my hair. The navy dress I wore this morning looks even better now, with my darker makeup and fuller hair. I wish hard and no, I don't. I don't, I repeat to myself and slip on my black heels. I grab my cell phone and purse before leaving the room to meet my friends are they my friends? I don't know but I feel like Kimberly is, and Trevor is very kind. Christian's my boss, so that's a little different. In the elevator, I text Landon to tell him that I'm having a great time in Seattle. I miss him, and I hope we can still remain close, even if Hardin and I aren't together anymore. When I step out of the elevator, I spot Trevor's black hair near the entrance. In his black dress pants and cream sweater, he reminds me of Noah a bit. I take a second to admire how handsome he looks, before I make my presence known. When his eyes find me, they go wide, and he makes a noise between a cough and a squeak. I can't help, but laugh a little as his cheeks flush. You look you look beautiful, he says. I smile and say, thank you. You don't look so bad yourself. His cheeks redden. Thanks, he murmurs. It's an odd thing, to see him off balance like this. He's usually so calm and collected. There they are. I hear Kimberly call. Wow, Kim. I say and wave my hand over my face, like I'm dispelling some illusion. She looks stunning in a red halter dress that only reaches halfway down her thighs. Her short blonde hair is pinned straight, 
making her look sexy, yet classy at the same time. I have a feeling we'll be fighting men off all night, Christian says to Trevor, and they both laugh as they escort us out to the sidewalk. At Christian's instruction, the car takes us to a really nice seafood restaurant, where I have the most delicious salmon and crab cakes, and where Christian tells us all sorts of hilarious stories about his days in publishing in New York. We all have a great time, and Trevor and Kimberly tease him a little, since he has a good sense of humor about everything. After dinner, the car takes us a short distance to an all-glass three-story building. Through its windows I watch hundreds of flashing lights illuminate swaying bodies, creating a fascinating mix of lights and darks across limbs and bodies. It's not far off from what I envisioned a club would be like, though much larger, and with a lot more people. As we get out, Kimberly grabs my arm. We'll go to a more laid-back place tomorrow, some of the guys from the conference wanted to come here, so here we are. She laughs. The very large man guarding the door holds a clipboard in his hands and is clearly controlling access to the inside. A line of expectant partygoers fills the entire sidewalk and reaches around the corner of the street. Will we have to wait long? I ask Trevor. Oh no. He chuckles. Mr. Vance doesn't wait. I soon see what he means when Christian whispers something to the bouncer and the big man moves the rope to let us through immediately. I'm a little dazed when I walk in, with music pounding and lights dancing across the massive smoke-filled space. I'm pretty sure I'll never understand why people like to pay to get a headache and inhale synthetic smoke while grinding on strangers. A woman in a short dress leads us up some stairs to a small room with thin curtains for walls. Within are two couches and a table. This is a VIP section, Tessa, Kimberly tells me as I look around with curious eyes. Oh, I answer simply, and follow their lead, by taking a seat on one of the couches. What do you usually drink? Trevor asks me. Oh, I don't usually, I answer. Me either. Well, I like wine, but I'm not much of a drinker. Oh no, you are drinking tonight, Tessa. You need it. Kimberly says loudly. I, I start to say. She'll have a sex on the beach, and so will I, she tells the woman. The hostess nods, and Christian orders a drink that I've never heard of and Trevor orders a glass of red wine. No one has yet questioned whether I'm of legal age or not. Maybe I look older than I am, or maybe Christian is known well enough here that people don't want to upset his company by asking. I have no idea what a sex on the beach is, but I prefer not to showcase my ignorance. When the woman returns, she hands me a tall glass with a piece of pineapple and a small pink umbrella sticking out of the top. I thank her and quickly take a sip through the straw. It is really very good, sweet but with a little kick of bitterness as I swallow. Good? Kim asks, and I nod, taking another long drink. Chapter 14. Harden. Aw, come on, Harden. One more, Molly says in my ear. I haven't decided yet if I want to get drunk. I've already had three shots, and I know, if I take another, I will be drunk. On the one hand, getting as plastered as I can, and forgetting about everything that's going on sounds nice. But on the other hand, I need to be able to think clearly. Do you want to get out of here? Molly says, slurring her words. Molly smells like pot and whiskey. Part of me wants to take her into the bathroom and fuck her, just because I can. Just because Tessa is in Seattle with fucking Trevor, and I am three hours away sitting on a couch half fucking drunk. Come on, Hardin, you know I can make you forget all about her, she says and scoots onto my lap. What? I ask her as she wraps her arms around my neck. Tessa. Let me make you forget her. You can fuck me until you can't even remember her name. Her hot breath touches my neck, and I pull away from her. Get off me, I say. What the fuck, Hardin, she snaps, her ego obviously wounded. I don't want you, I say harshly. Since when? You didn't have a problem fucking me all those other times. Not since I start to say. Not since what? She jumps up off the couch, swinging her arms around wildly. Since you met that stuck-up bitch? I have to remind myself that Molly is a female and not the actual demon she acts like, before I do something stupid. Don't talk about her like that. 
I stand up. It's true, and now look at you. You're like a fucking lost puppy over some Virgin Mary turned skank who obviously doesn't even want you, she yells, laughing or crying. Those things tend to look almost the same on Molly. I clench my fists as Jace and Zed appear next to her. Molly puts a hand on Jace's shoulder. Tell him, guys. Tell him that he's a fucking snore ever, since we added him to her. Not we. You, Zed corrects her. She glares at him. Same thing, she says, and he rolls his eyes. What's the problem? Jace asks. Nothing, I answer for her. She's just upset, because I won't fuck her needy ass. No, I'm pissed because you're an asshole. No one wants you around anyway. That's why Jace told me to tell her in the first place. All I see is red. He what? I say through my teeth. I knew Jace was a dick, but I thought for sure it was Molly's jealousy that drove her to reveal everything to Tessa the way she did. Yeah, he told me to tell her. He had it all planned, I was going to tell her right in front of you, after she had a couple drinks, then he was going to chase after her, and comfort her, while you were crying like a fucking baby. She laughs. What was it that you said, Jace? You were going to fuck her brains out? Molly says, using her claws to make air quotes. I take a step toward Jace. Hey, it was just a joke, man, he starts to say. If I'm not mistaken, a smirk plays on Zed's lips as my fist connects with Jace's jaw. I feel nothing on my knuckles from the repeated blows to Jace's face. My anger overpowers everything as I climb on top of him to continue my assault. Images of him touching Tessa, kissing her, undressing her flash through my mind, making me hit him harder. The blood on his face only pushes me on, making me want to hurt him as much as I possibly can. Jace's black frame glasses lie broken and shattered next to his bloody face as strong hands pull me off him. Come on, man. You're going to kill him, if you don't stop. Logan yells in my face, snapping me back to reality somewhat. If any of you have anything to fucking say to me, say it now. I yell to the group I had once considered friends, or the closest things I had to such. Everyone stays silent, even Molly. I mean it. If anyone says another fucking word about her, I won't hesitate to take each and every one of you motherfuckers down. I take one last look at Jace, who is struggling to get up off the floor and walk out of Zed's apartment into the cold night. Chapter 15. Tessa. These taste so good. I practically yell at Kimberly as I suck down the remainder of my fruity drink. I greedily shift the straw around the ice to try to get as much as I can out of the glass. She beams. Want another? Her eyes are a little red, but she's still compassed, whereas I feel funny and light. Drunk. That's the word I'm looking for. I nod eagerly, and find myself tapping my fingertips on my knees to the beat of the music. Are you feeling okay? Trevor laughs when he notices. Yeah, I feel really good actually. I yell over the music. We should dance. Kimberly says. I don't dance. Well, by don't I mean can't, not to this type of music anyway. I've never danced the way the people inside the club are dancing, and usually I would be terrified of joining them. But then the alcohol buzzing in my veins gives me courage like never before. Fudge it, let's dance. I exclaim. Kimberly smiles, then turns and gives Christian a kiss on the lips, lingering longer than normal. Then in a flash she stands up and hauls me off of the couch pulling me out toward the crowded dance floor. As we pass a railing, I look down and see the two stories below us filled with people dancing. Everyone looks so lost in their own world it's intimidating and intriguing at the same time. Of course, Kimberly moves expertly, so I close my eyes and just try to let the music take control of my body. I feel awkward, but I just want to fit in with her. I have nothing else. After I've danced through an unknown number of songs and two more drinks, the room begins to spin. I excuse myself to head for the bathroom, grabbing my purse on the way and pushing through endless sweaty bodies. I feel my phone start vibrating in my bag, so I dig it out. It's my mother. No way I'm answering that, I'm way too drunk to talk to her right now. When I hit the bathroom line, something makes me scroll through my inbox, and I immediately frown at the realization 
That Hardin hasn't texted me. Maybe I should see what he's up to? No. I can't do that. That would be irresponsible, and I would regret it tomorrow. The flashing lights bouncing off the walls are starting to get to me as I wait in line. I try to concentrate on my phone screen, hoping the feeling goes away. When the door to one of the stalls finally opens, I bolt in and lean over the toilet, waiting for my body to decide whether to get sick. I hate this feeling. If you were here, Hardin would bring me water, he would offer to hold my hair back. No. No, he wouldn't. I should call him. Realizing I won't be sick, I exit the little room and go to the sink area. Hitting a couple of buttons on my phone, I place it between my shoulder and cheek and tear a paper towel from the dispenser. I place it under a faucet to wet it, but the water doesn't come until I wiggle the towel around the sensor. I hate these automatic sinks. My eyeliner has run a little, and I look like a different person. My hair is wild, and my eyes are bloodshot. After the third ring, I hang up and set my phone on the edge of the sink. Why the hell isn't he answering? I ask myself, and right then my phone starts to vibrate, almost falling into the water, which makes me laugh. I have no idea why, but I find it amusing. Hardin's name appears on the screen, and I swipe my wet finger across the screen. Harold? I say into the phone. Harold? Oh lord, I drank way too much. Hardin's voice sounds funny and breathless when it comes through. Tessa? Is everything okay? Did you call me? God, his voice is heavenly. I don't know, does your caller ID say that I did? Because if so, there's probably a good chance it was me. I laugh as I say this. His tone changes. Have you been drinking? Maybe, I squeak and toss the makeshift wipe into the trash. Two drunken girls enter the area and one of them trips over her own feet, making everyone laugh. They stumble into the largest stall, and I focus my attention back on my phone call. Where are you? Hardin asks harshly. Oh, calm down, would you? He always tells me to calm down, so now it's my turn. He sighs. Tessa I can tell he's angry, but my head's too fuzzy to care. How much did you drink, he asks. I dunno like five. Or six. I think, I answer and lean against the wall. The cold tile feels amazing on my hot skin through the thin material of my dress. Five or six what? Sex is on the beach as we never had sex on the beach, that could have been fun, I say with a smirk. I wish I could see his stupid face right now. Not stupid beautiful. But stupid sounds better right now. Oh god, you're trashed, he says. Somehow I know that he's running his fingers through his hair. Where are you, he asks again. I know it's immature, but I reply, somewhere you're not. Obviously. Now tell me. Are you at a nightclub? He barks. Ooh oh someone is a grumpy gills. I laugh. Clearly he can hear the music in the background, so when he threatens, I can easily find out where you are, I sort of believe him. Not that I care. The words are out before I can stop them, why didn't you call me today? What? He asks, clearly thrown off by my question. You didn't try to call me today. I sound pathetic. I didn't think you wanted me to. I don't, but still. Well, I'll call you tomorrow, he says calmly. Don't get off the phone yet. I'm not I was just saying that I'll call you tomorrow, even if you don't pick up, he explains and my heart leaps. I try to sound neutral. Okay. What am I doing? So now can you tell me where you are? Nope. Is Trevor there? His tone is serious. Yeah, but Kim is, too and Christian. I'm defending, though I don't know why. So this was the plan, then? To take you to the conference, and get you wasted, and take you to a fucking club? He raises his voice. You need to go back to your hotel. You weren't used to drinking, and now you're out in Trevor, I hang up before he can finish. Who does he think he is? He's lucky that I even called him, drunk or not. What a buzzkill. I need another drink. My phone vibrates repeatedly, but I press ignore each time. Take that, Hardin. I find my way back to our VIP section and ask the cocktail waitress for another drink. Are you okay? Kimberly asks. Do you look pissed? Yeah, I'm fine. I lie down my drink 
as soon as the waitress brings it. Hardin is such a jerk, he's the reason that we aren't together, and he has the nerve to try to yell at me when I call him. He could be here with me right now if he hadn't done what he did. Instead, Trevor is. Trevor, who is very sweet and very handsome. What? Trevor smiles at me when he catches me staring. I laugh and look away. Nothing. After I finish another drink and we talk about how great tomorrow will be, I stand back up. I'm going to dance again. I call to them. Trevor looks like he wants to say something, maybe even offer to come with me, but his cheeks flame and he stays quiet. Kimberly looks like she's had enough and waves me off, but I don't mind going out there on my own. I find my way to the middle of the dance floor and start to move. I probably look ridiculous, but it feels good to enjoy the music and let everything else go, like my drunken phone call to Harden. After about half a song, I sense a tall figure behind me, near me. I turn to find a pretty cute guy in dark jeans and a white shirt. His brown hair is shaved into a buzz cut, and his smile is handsome enough. He's no Harden, but then, no one is. Stop thinking about Harden, I remind myself as the man puts his hands on my hips and says close in my ear, can I join you? I'm sure, I reply. But really it's the alcohol that's speaking for me. You're very beautiful, he says, then turns me around, closing the gap between us. He pushes up against my back, and I close my eyes, trying to imagine that I'm someone else. A woman who dances with strangers in a club. The beat to the second song is slower, more sensual, which makes my hips move slower. We turn to face each other, and he brings my hand to his mouth and touches his lips to my skin. His eyes meet mine and the next thing I know he has his tongue in my mouth. My heart screams for me to push him away, almost gagging at the unfamiliar taste of him. But my brain, my brain says something entirely different, kiss him to forget about Hardin. Kiss him. So I ignore the sick feeling in my stomach. I close my eyes and move my tongue across his. I've kissed more guys in my three months at college than I have in my whole life. The stranger's hands move to my back and inch down farther. Do you want to come back to my place? He says as our mouths disconnect. What? I heard him, but something in me hopes that. By saying what I say I can erase that question. My place, let's go, he slurs. Oh I don't think that's a good idea. Oh, it's a good idea. He laughs. The multicolored light strobe across his face, making him look odd and much more threatening than before. What makes you think I would go home with you? I don't even know you. I shout over the music. Because you were just all over me and loved it, you dirty girl, he says like it's obvious and not offensive. Just as I prepare myself to scream at him or knee him in the crotch, I try to calm down and think clearly for a second. I was just grinding on this guy and then I kissed him. Of course he's going to want more. What the hell is wrong with me? I just made out with a stranger in a club, this is not me. I'm sorry, but no, I say and walk away. When I get back my group, Trevor looks like he's about to fall asleep on the couch. I can't help but smile at his adorableness. Is that even a word? God, I drank too much. I take a seat and grab a bottled water out of the ice bin on the table. Have fun? Kimberly asks me, and I nod. Yeah, I had a great time, I say, despite what happened a few minutes ago. Are you almost ready, honey? We have to get up early, Christian says to Kim. Yup. I'm ready when you are. She runs her hand up his thigh. I look away and feel my cheeks flush. I poke Trevor. Are you coming or are you going to sleep here? I tease. He laughs and sits up straight. I haven't decided, this couch is comfortable. The music so soothing Christian calls the driver, who says he'll be here in a few minutes. We all get up and decide to walk down the spiral staircase that runs along one side of the club. At the first floor bar, Kimberly orders one last drink, and I debate whether to have another while we wait, but realize I've had enough. If I have another, I might pass out or throw up. Neither of which I want to do. When Christian gets a text, we all move toward the exit. I welcome the cold air on my hot skin, thankful there is only a light breeze as we climb into the car. 
It's almost three in the morning when we get back to the hotel. I'm drunk and starving. After raiding my mini fridge and eating almost everything inside, I stumble over to the bed and plop down without even removing my shoes. Chapter 16. Tessa. Shred up, I grumble when an obnoxious noise pulls me from my drunken slumber. It takes me a few seconds to realize the noise isn't my mother yelling at me for something, but rather someone banging on my door. God, I'm coming. I shout and stumble my way to the door. But then I stop and glance at the clock on the desk. It's almost four in the morning. Who the hell could that be? Even in my drunken state, my mind begins to race with sharp fear. What if it's Harden? It's been over three hours since I drunk dialed him, but how would he find me? What will I say to him? I'm not ready for this. When the pounding recommences, I throw all my thoughts aside and swing the door open, preparing for the worst. But it's just Trevor. Disappointment stings in my chest, and I wipe up my eyes. I feel just as drunk now as I did when I lay down. Sorry for waking you, but do you have my phone? He asks. Huh? I say and back into the room, so he can enter. When the door swings shut behind him, we're engulfed in relative darkness, the only light being from the city outside my window. I'm too drunk to find the light switch, though. I think our phones got switched. I have yours and I think you grabbed mine by accident. He holds my phone out in his palm. I was going to wait until the morning, but yours just wouldn't stop ringing and ringing. Oh is all I say, I walk over and open my purse. Sure enough, Trevor's phone is sitting on top of my wallet. I'm sorry must have grabbed yours in the car, I apologize and hand it to him. It's okay. I'm really sorry for waking you up. You're the only girl I know who looks just as beautiful, when she wakes up as she did, a loud banging at the door cuts him off, and the sudden noise infuriates me. What the hell is this? Party in Tessa's room? I yell and stomp to the door, ready to yell at whatever hotel employee is likely here to reprimand me for the noise Trevor made ironically by making more noise than he did. Just as I reach for the door, the noise gets even louder, which shocks me into stillness. I then I hear it, Tessa. Open this damn door. Hardin's voice booms through the air, as if no barrier at all stood between us. A light flips on behind me, and I see Trevor's face pale with real fear. Hardin finding him in my room, won't go over well, regardless of what was really going on. Hide in the bathroom, I say, and Trevor's eyes widen. What? I can't hide in the bathroom, he exclaims, and I realize how ridiculous that idea is. Open the fucking door. Hardin yells again, and then he starts kicking it. Repeatedly. I look at Trevor again, before opening the door, trying to memorize his handsome face before Hardin mutilates it. I'm coming. I yell and open the door halfway, to find a fuming Hardin, dressed in all black. My drunk eyes wander, and I notice that instead of his thick boots, he's wearing plain black converses. I've never seen him in any shoes except his boots. I like these new shoes, but I'm getting distracted. Hardin pushes the door open and blows right by me, going for Trevor. Luckily, I grab his shirt and manage to stop him, somehow. Do you think you can get her drunk and come into her fucking hotel room? Hardin screams at him and tries to surge forward. I know he isn't trying as much as he could, because in that case I would surely be on the floor, not holding him by his thin shirt. I saw that light flip on through the peephole, what were you two doing alone in the dark here? I wasn't I, Trevor begins. Hardin, stop it. You can't go around beating people up. I shout and tug at his shirt. Yes I can, though, he growls. Trevor, I say. Go back to your room so I can talk some sense into him. I'm sorry for his crazy ass behavior. Trevor almost laughs at my word choice, but one look from Hardin silences him. Hardin turns to me as Trevor leaves the room. Crazy ass behavior? Yes, crazy. You can't just show up here and barge into my room trying to beat my friend up. He shouldn't have been in here. Why was he in here? Why are you still dressed? And fuck. Where did that rest come from, he says, eyeing my body. I ignore the heat stirring in my belly and focus on my indignation. He came to get his phone, because I took it by accident. 
And I can't remember any of the other questions you just asked, I admit. Well, maybe you shouldn't have drunk so much. I'll drink what and why and how and when I want. Thank you. He rolls his eyes. You're annoying when you're drunk. He flops down on the wingback chair. You're annoying when you're everything. And who said you could sit down? I huff, crossing my arms. Hardin looks up at me with those brilliant green eyes. God, he looks so hot right now. I can't believe he was in your room. I can't believe you're in my room, I counter. Did you fuck him? What? How dare you even ask me that? I shout. Answer the question. No, you asshole. Of course I didn't. Were you going to, do you want to? Oh my god, Hardin. You're insane. I shake my head and pace between the window and bed. Well then, why are you still dressed? That doesn't even make sense. I roll my eyes. Besides, it's none of your business who I have sex with. Maybe I did have sex with him, maybe I had sex with someone else. The corners of my mouth threaten a smile, but I force a straight expression as I say slowly, you will never know. My words have the intended effect, and Hardin's face turns dark, animalistic. What did you just say, he barks. Oh, this is much more fun than I thought it would be. I like being drunk around Hardin, because I say things without thinking, things that I mean, and everything seems funny. You heard me I say, and move to stand over Hardin. Maybe I let the guy at the club, take me into the bathroom. Maybe Trevor took me on this bed, I say and casually look back at the bed over my shoulder. Shut up. Shut up now, Tessa. Hardin warns me. But I laugh. I feel empowered, strong, and I feel like ripping Hardin's shirt off of him. What's wrong, Hardin? Don't like the idea of Trevor's hands all over my body? I don't know if it's Hardin's anger, the alcohol, or the fact that I miss him, but without letting myself overthink my actions, I climb onto his lap on the chair. My knees rest on either side of his thighs. Completely taken aback by my action, if I'm not mistaken, he's shaking. W what are you what are you doing, Tessa? Tell me, Hardin, do you like the idea of Trev, stop it. Stop saying that, he begs and I oblige. Oh, lighten up, Hardin, you know I wouldn't do that. I wrap my arms around his neck. The nostalgic feeling that washes over me at being in his arms almost takes my breath away. You're drunk. Tessa, he says and tries to remove my arms from around him. So I want you, I say, surprising both of us. I decide to shut my thoughts off, the logical ones, anyway, and grab two fistfuls of his hair. Oh, how I've missed the way it feels between my fingers. Tessa you don't know what you're doing. You're wasted, he says. But there's no conviction behind his voice. Hard and stop overthinking this. Don't you miss me? I say against his neck, sucking lightly. My hormones have completely taken over, and I don't know that I've ever wanted him so badly. Yes he hisses as I suck harder, sure to leave a mark. I can't, Tess please. But I refuse to stop and instead rock my hips on his lap, making him groan. No he whispers, and grips his large hands on my hips, stopping my movements. I snap and glare at him. You have two options here, you fuck me or you leave. You decide. What the hell did I just say? You'll hate me tomorrow, if I do this, while you're in the state, he says and looks into my eyes. I already hate you, I say, and he flinches from my words. Sort of, I add more softly than I mean to. He loosens his grip on my hips, allowing me to move. Can we at least talk about this all first? No, stop being such a Debbie Downer. I groan and rub myself against his leg. We can't do this not like this. Since when does he have morals? I know you want to, Hardin, I can feel how hard you are for me, I say in his ear. I can't believe the dirty words falling from my drunken lips, but Hardin's mouth is a deep pink, and his eyes are wide, almost black. Come on, Hardin, don't you want to bend me over this desk? Or the bed? The sink? So many possibilities I whisper up close and gently bite his earlobe. Fuck okay. Fuck it, he says and wraps his hands in my hair, pulling my mouth to his. The moment Hardin's lips touch mine, my body ignites. I moan into his mouth, 
and am rewarded with an equally feverish sound from Hardin. My fingers thread through his hair and tug harder, not able to control myself or my need for him. I know he's holding back, and it's driving me crazy. My hands move from his hair down to the hem of his black t-shirt, gripping the fabric and pulling it up and over his head. The second the kiss breaks, Hardin leans back slightly. Tessa he pleads. Hardin, I counter and run my fingertips over his ink. I've missed the way his hard muscles strain against his skin, the way the intricate black ink swirls and decorates his perfect body. I can't take advantage of you, he says but then moans as I swipe my tongue over his bottom lip. I let out a derisive little chuckle. Just stop talking. As my hand reaches down to palm him through his jeans, I know that he can't resist me, which pleases me more than it should. I never thought I would be in a situation with Hardin, where I'd have all the control. It's amusing, really, the way we've switched roles. He's so hard, and so turned on, I climb off of him, and reach for his zipper. Chapter 17. Hardin. My mind's racing, and I know how wrong this is, but I can't help it. I want her, need her. Long for her. I have to have her, and she gave me an edict to either leave or fuck her, so there is no way I'm leaving her, if those are my options. The words that came out of her mouth sounded so unnatural, so strange but so hot. Her small hands reach down to unbutton and unzip my jeans. When my belt hits my ankles, I shake my head. I'm not thinking clearly. I'm not thinking rationally. I'm wasted, completely gone for this usually sweet, now wild woman, that I love more than I can stand. Wait I say again, not really wanting her to stop, but the good part of me wants to at least put up a little fight to ease the guilt it feels. No no waiting. I've waited enough. Her voice is soft and teasing as she pulls my boxers down and grips me in her hand. Fuck, Tessa that's the idea. Fuck. Tessa. I can't stop her. Not even if I wanted to. She needs this, needs me. And drunk or not, I am selfish enough to take it, if this is the only way I can have her wanting me. She drops to her knees in front of me, and takes me into her mouth. When I look down at her, she looks up at me, batting her lashes. Fuck, she looks like an angel and the devil at once, so sweet and so goddamn dirty as she works her tongue around me, swirling and flicking. She pauses with my cock next to her face, and asks with a smirk, do you like me like that? I almost come from her words. I nod, unable to speak, as she swallows me again, hollows her cheeks, and sucks harder, taking more of me into her sweet mouth. I don't want her to stop, but I need to touch her. To feel her. Stop, I beg and gently push her back by her shoulder. She shakes her head, and tortures me by moving her head up and down at a dangerous speed. Tessa please, I moan, but I feel her laugh, a deep vibration, that rumbles through me until, luckily, she stops just before I'm about to come down her throat. She smiles and wipes her now swollen lips with the back of her hand. Do you just taste so good? Fuck, where did this dirty mouth of yours come from? I ask her as she gets up off of her knees. I don't know I always think these things. I just never have the balls to say them, she says and moves toward the bed. I almost laugh from her saying balls. It's so unlike her, but tonight she's in charge, and she knows it. I can tell she's enjoying this, having me at her complete and utter mercy. This dress she has on is enough to break any man. The way the fabric clings to her every curve, every dip in her flawless skin, is the sexiest thing I've ever seen. That is, until she pulls it over her head, tossing it at me playfully. I can literally feel my eyes straining to pop out of my head when I take her body in. The white lace of her bra is barely holding her full breasts inside, and her matching panties are bunched up on one side, revealing the soft skin between her hip and pubic bones. She loves to be kissed there, even though I know she's embarrassed by the thin, almost transparent white lines on her skin. I have no idea why. She is flawless to me, marks and all. Your turn. She smiles and lets her heels hit the bed, before she falls backward onto the mattress. I've been dreaming of this since the day she left me. I didn't think it would ever come, and now that it's happening, I know that I need to pay attention to every detail, because it probably won't happen again. I must pause a little bit too long, because she cocks her head up, 
and looks at me with a raised brow. Do I need to start myself? She teases. Christ, she's insatiable right now. Instead of answering, I join her on the bed. I sit next to her legs, and she impatiently tugs at her panties. I move her hands away and pull them down for her. I've missed you so much, I say, but she just grabs my hair and pushes my face down where she wants it. I shake my head but give in, pressing my lips against her. She whines and squirms under my tongue as I pay extra attention to her most sensitive bud. I know how much she loves this. I remember the first time I touched her, she had asked, what is that? Her innocence was, and still is such a turn on for me. Oh my god, Hardin, she moans. I've missed that sound. Normally I would say something about how wet she is, how ready, but I can't find any words. I'm too consumed by her noises and her hands gripping the sheets from the pleasure I'm giving her. I slip one finger inside of her, sliding in and out, and she whimpers. More, Hardin please, more, she begs, and I give her what she wants. I circle and curl both fingers inside of her, before pulling them out, and giving her my tongue. I notice her legs stiffening, the way they always do when she's close. I pull back to watch my fingers rub over her, quickly from side to side, and she screams, literally screams my name, as she comes all over my fingers. I stare at her, taking in every detail, the way her eyes screw shut, the way her mouth forms an almost perfect O, the way her chest and cheeks flush a light pink as she goes through her orgasm. I love her, fuck, do I love her. I can't help, but slide my fingers into my mouth after she finishes. She tastes so good, and it's something I hope I can remember when she leaves me. Again. The rapid rising and falling of her chest distracts me and her eyes fly open. Her beautiful face holds a huge grin, and I can't help but smile as she hooks her finger to tell me to come closer. Do you have a condom? She asks wickedly as I lean over her. Yeah, I answer. A frown takes over the smile, and I hope she doesn't think too much into this. It's just a habit, I admit truthfully. Don't care, she mumbles and looks over at my jeans on the floor. She sits up and grabs them, digging in the pockets until she finds what she's looking for. I reluctantly grab the foil packet and hold her gaze. You're sure? I ask for the twentieth time. Yes. And if you ask again, I will go down to Trevor's room with your condom, she barks. I lower my eyes at her. She's ruthless tonight, but I can't imagine her with anyone but me. Maybe because it would kill me. My heart begins to race as I picture her with that phonoa, my blood heating, and my temper rising. Have it your way, then, he'll be, she starts to say, but I cut her off by placing my hand over her mouth. Don't you dare finish that, I growl at her, and feel her lips pull into a smile beneath my hand. I know this isn't healthy, her antagonizing me this way and me fucking her while she's drunk, but it seems neither of us can help it. I can't deny her, when I know she wants me, and there's the chance the small chance that if she's reminded of what we have together she'll give me another shot. I remove my hand from her mouth and tear open the condom. As soon as I roll it on, she climbs onto my lap. I want to do it this way first, she insists, gripping my length, before she lowers herself onto me. I let out a sigh full of defeat and pleasure as she rolls her hips against mine. She moves herself slowly in circles, creating the sweetest rhythm. The shape of her body, the perfect fullness of her curvy hips, is mesmerizing and so fucking sexy as she rides me. I know I won't last long. I have been deprived for too long. The only relief I've gotten lately is from myself, while imagining it was her. Talk to me, Hardin, talk to me like you used to, she whimpers and wraps her arms around my neck, pulling me closer to her. I hate the way she says used to like it was really so long ago. I lift off the bed slightly to meet her movements, and bring my mouth to her ear. Do you like when I say filthy things to you, don't you? I breathe and she moans. Answer me, I say, and she nods her head yes. I knew you did, you try to act all innocent, but I know better. I nip at her neck. My self-control has diminished, and I suck her skin harshly, making sure to leave a mark. For fucking Trevor to see. For everyone to see. You know I'm the only one who can make you feel like this, 
You know no one else can make you scream the way I can no one knows exactly where to touch you, I say and reach down and rub her where our bodies join. She's soaking, my fingers glide easily over the moisture. Oh god she purrs. Say it, Tessa, say that I'm the only one. I rub her clit in tighter circles and move my hips to thrust into her, while she continues moving on her own. You're. Her eyes roll back in her head. She's so lost in her passion for me, and I'm joining her. I'm what? I need to hear her say it, even if she's lying. My desperation for her terrifies me. I grab her hips and flip us over, me hovering over her, and she shrieks as I pound into her harder than ever before. Dot my fingers dig into her full hips. I need her to feel me, feel all of me, and I need her to love the way I claim her. She's mine and I'm hers. Her soft skin is glistening with sweat, and she looks absolutely delicious. Her breasts move rhythmically with my force, and her eyes roll back in her head. You the only one heart and the only she says, and I watch her bite her lip, grab at her face, and then at mine. I watch her come completely undone beneath me and it's beautiful. The way she lets go of everything as she comes, is too damn perfect. Her words are all I needed to find my own release, and she rakes her nails down my back. The sting is welcomed, I love the passion between us. I lean up, bringing her body with me, resting her on my lap, so she can ride me again. My arms wrap around her back, and her head falls onto my shoulder as I lift my hips off of the bed. My cock moves in and out of her at a steady pace as I spill into the condom with a groan of her name. I lie back with my arms still wrapped around her body, and she sighs when I run my fingers over her forehead, pushing her sweat-soaked hair from her face. Her chest rises and falls, rises, and falls, comforting me. I love you, I tell her, and try to look at her, but she turns her head and touches a finger roughly to my lips. S-H-H-H I can just S-H-H-H I roll her off and say softly, we need to talk about this. Sleep up in three hours sleep she mumbles, and wraps her arm around my waist. Her holding me feels better than the sex we just had, and the idea of sleeping in the same bed as her thrills me, it has been too long. Okay, I say and kiss her forehead. She flinches slightly, but I know she's too exhausted to fight me. I love you, I tell her again, but when she doesn't say anything else, I soothe myself by deciding she's already fallen asleep. Our relationship or whatever this is, has done a complete turnaround in just one night. I have suddenly become everything I was terrified of being, and she has complete control of me. She could make me the happiest man on earth, or she could crush me with one word. Chapter 18 Tessa. The song of my phone alarm breaks into my sleep like a dancing penguin. Literally, my dream mind incorporates it as a dancing penguin. But that pleasant fantasy doesn't last long. I wake up a little more, and my head immediately begins to pound. When I try to sit up, I am weighed down by something someone. Oh no. Memories of dancing with some creepy guy flood my mind. Panicked, I snap my eyes open to find instead the familiar tattooed skin of Hardin sprawled across me. He has his head on my stomach and an arm wrapped around me. Oh my god. What the hell? I try to push Hardin off without waking him, but he groans and slowly opens his eyes. He closes them again and lifts himself off of me, untangling our legs. I jump off the bed and when he opens his eyes again, he doesn't say anything but just watches me like I'm some sort of predatory animal. The image of Hardin thrusting into me relentlessly and me calling out his name plays through my thoughts. What the hell was I thinking? I want to say something, but, honestly, I have no idea what. I am freaking out inside, having a total meltdown. As if sensing my struggle, he climbs off the bed, taking the sheet with him and wrapping it around his naked body. Oh my god. He sits in the chair and looks up at me, and I realize I'm only wearing my bra. Instinctively, I squeeze my legs together and sit back on the bed. Say something, he instructs. I, I don't know what to say, I admit. I can't believe this happened. I can't believe Hardin is here, in my bed, naked. I'm sorry, he says, and his head falls into his hands. My head is pounding from the excessive alcohol I consumed only hours ago and the fact that I slept with Hardin last night. You should be, I mutter. He tugs at his hair. 
You called me. I didn't tell you to come here, I retort. I haven't decided how to handle this. I haven't decided if I want to fight with him, to kick him out, or to try to handle this like an adult. I get up and head for the bathroom, his voice traveling with me as I do. You were drunk, and I thought you were in trouble or something, and Trevor was here. I turn on the shower and look into the mirror. On my neck is a deep red bruise. Freaking hell. As I run my fingers over the sensitive mark, my mind travels to Hardin's tongue on my skin. I must still be a little intoxicated because I can't think straight. I thought I was moving on, and yet here is my heartbreaker in my room, and here I am with a massive hickey on my neck like some wild teenager. Tessa, he says and enters the bathroom as I step into the hot water. I stay quiet as the scalding water rinses off my sins. Are you? His voice cracks. Are you okay with what happened last night? Why is he acting so weird? I would have expected a cocky smirk, and at least five year welcomes the second his eyes opened. I I don't know. No, I'm not okay with it, I tell him. Do you hate me, you know even more than before? The vulnerability lays through his voice tugs at my heart, but I need to stand my ground. Everything about this situation is a mess. I had just started to get over him. No you didn't, my subconscious mocks, but I ignore her. No. It's about the same, I say. Oh. I rinse my hair one last time and give a little prayer that the shower water will rehydrate me out of a hangover. I didn't mean to take advantage of you. I swear it, he says as I turn the shower off. I grab a towel off of the small rack and wrap it around me. He is leaning in the doorway in only his boxers, his chest and neck littered with red spots of his own. I'm never drinking again. Tessa, I know you're probably angry, but we have a lot to talk about. No, we don't. I was drunk and called you. You came here and we had sex. What else is there to talk about? I'm trying to stay as calm as I can. I don't want him to know the effect that he has on me. That last night had on me. Then I noticed the raw skin on his knuckles. What happened to your hands? I ask. Oh my god, Hardin, you beat Trevor up, didn't you? I yell, then wins from the shooting pain in my head. What? No, I didn't. He raises his hands in defense. Then who? He shakes his head. It doesn't matter. We have more important things to talk about. No, we don't. Nothing has changed. I open my makeup bag and pull out the concealer. I begin applying it to my neck generously, while Hardin stands behind me silently. This was a mistake, I shouldn't have even called you, I finally say, annoyed when the third layer of concealer doesn't cover the spot. It wasn't a mistake, you obviously missed me. That's why you called. What? No. I called because because it was an accident. I didn't mean to. You're lying. He knows me too well. You know what? It doesn't matter why I called, I snap. You didn't have to come here. I grab the eyeliner and begin applying it, thick. Yes, I did. You were drunk and God knows what could have happened. Oh, like what? I could have slept with someone who I shouldn't have? His cheeks flare. I know I am being harsh but he should have known better than to sleep with me when I was so drunk. I rake my hairbrush through my wet hair. You didn't give me much of a choice, if you remember, he says equally harshly. I remember, I remember climbing onto his lap and grinding myself against him. I remember demanding he have sex with me or leave. I remember him telling me no and to stop. I'm humiliated and horrified at my behavior, but maybe worst of all, I am reminded of the first time I kissed him and he claimed I'd thrown myself at him. Anger boils inside me, and I throw my brush against the counter with a loud clatter. Don't you dare try to blame this all on me, you could have said no. I shout. I did. Repeatedly, he shouts back. I had no idea what was going on, and you know it. I half lie. I knew what I wanted, I'm just not willing to admit it. But he begins repeating my dirty words from last night, you just taste so good. Talk to me like you used to. You the only one, Hardin. And it pushes me over the edge. Get out. Get out now. I yell and go grab my phone to check the time. You weren't telling me to get out last night, he says cruelly. I turn to face him. 
I was doing just fine before you even came here. Trevor was here, I say, because I know how mad it will make him. But he surprises me by laughing. Oh please, you and I both know Trevor isn't enough for you. You wanted me, only me. You still do, he scoffs. I was drunk, Hardin. Why would I want you, when I can have him? I instantly regret the words. Hardin's eyes flash with either pain or jealousy, and I take a step toward him. Don't, he says, holding his arm out. You know what, that's fine. He can fucking have you. I don't even know why I came here. I should have known you would act like this. I try to keep my voice down before someone calls in a complaint, but I'm not sure I'm able to pull that off. Are you kidding me? Do you come here and take advantage of me, and have the nerve to insult me? Take advantage of you? You took advantage of me, Tessa. You know that I can't say no to you, and you kept pushing and pushing. I know he's right, but now I'm pissed off and humiliated by my aggressive behavior last night. It doesn't matter who took advantage of who, all that matters is that you are leaving and not coming around me again, I say with finality, then turn the blow dryer on to muffle his comeback. Within seconds, he's ripped the blow dryer cord and nearly the outlet from the wall. What the hell is wrong with you? I yell and plug it back in. You could have broken that. Hard and so infuriating, what the hell was I thinking, calling him? I'm not leaving until you talk to me about all of this, he huffs. Ignoring the pain in my chest, I tell him, I already told you, we have nothing to talk about. You hurt me, and I can't forgive you. End of story. As much as I try to fight it, deep down I love having him here. Even if we're fighting and yelling at each other, I've missed him so much. You haven't even tried to forgive me, he says, his voice much softer. Yes, I have. I have tried mentally to get over this, but I can't. I can't trust that this isn't still part of your game. I can't trust you won't hurt me again. I plug my curling iron in and sigh. I need to finish getting ready. When I turn the blow dryer back on, he disappears from the bathroom, and I hope he leaves. The small part of me that hopes he's sitting on the bed when I come out is an idiot. She isn't the rational part of me. She's the naive, ridiculous girl who fell in love with a boy who is the furthest thing from what she needs. Hardin and I will never work, I know that. I just wish she did too. I curl and style my hair, making sure that it will cover Hardin's mark on my neck. When I walk out of the bathroom to gather my clothes, Hardin is sitting on the bed, and that stupid girl rejoices a little. I grab my light red bra and panties out of my bag and slip them on without removing my towel. When I drop the towel, Hardin gasps, then tries to hide it with a cough. As I slip a dress over my head, I feel like I'm being pulled toward him by an invisible string, but I fight it and grab my white dress out of the closet. I feel strangely comfortable around him right now, considering our situation. Why is this all so confusing and consuming? Why does it have to be so complicated? And most importantly why can't I just get over him and move on? You really should go, I say quietly. Do you need help? He asks when I struggle with sipping the dress. No I'm fine. I've got it. Here. He stands up to walk over to me. We are walking this fine line between love and hate, anger, and calm. It's strange and surely toxic for me. I lift my hair, and he zips my dress, taking longer than he should. I feel my pulse quicken, and scold myself for allowing him to help me. How did you find me? I ask him, just as soon as the thought enters my mind. He shrugs like he didn't just stalk me across the state. I called Vance, of course. He gave you my room number? I'm not pleased at the idea. No, the front desk did. He gives a little smirk. I can be very persuasive. That the hotel would do that doesn't make me feel any better. We can't do this you know, you making jokes and acting all friendly, I say and step into my black heels. He grabs his pants and starts putting them on. Why not? Because it's not good for either of us to be around the other. He smiles, those evil dimples coming out. You know that's not true, he says casually, and puts on his t-shirt. Yes, it is. No. Will you please just go? I beg. You don't mean that, I know you don't. You knew what you were doing, when you let me stay. No, I didn't, I whine. 
I was intoxicated. I didn't know what I was doing at all last night, from kissing that guy to letting you in. Immediately, I snapped my mouth shut. I did not just say that out loud. But by the way Hardin's eyes pop and his jaw clenches, I know that I did. My headache multiplies by 10 and I want to slap myself. WHWH what? What did you what did you just say, he growls. Nothing are you kissed someone? Who, he asks, his voice strained, as if he just ran a marathon. Someone at the club, I admit. Are you serious, he breathes. And when I nod, he explodes. What the, what the actual fuck, Tessa? You kiss some guy at a fucking club, then have sex with me? Who are you? He runs his hands over his face. If I know him as well as I think I do, he's getting ready to break something. It just happened, and we aren't even together. I try to defend myself, but only make myself sound worse. Wow you are unbelievable. My Tessa would never kiss a fucking stranger at a club, he barks. There is no your Tessa, I tell him. He just shakes his head no over and over and over again. Finally he stares deep into my eyes and says, you know what? You're right. And just to let you know, while you were kissing that guy? I was fucking Molly. Chapter 19. Tessa. I was fucking Molly. 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 Hardin's words echo in my head over and over long after he slammed the door and marched out of my life forever. I try to calm myself down before having to go down to meeting everyone. I should have known Hardin was toying with me, I should have known that he was still messing around with that skank. Hell, he was probably sleeping with her the whole time he was dating me. How could I be so stupid? I almost believed him last night, when he said he loved me, I was thinking, why else would he drive all the way to Seattle? But the answer really is, because he's Hardin, and he does things like that to mess with me. He always has and always will. Confusing me is this guilt I feel for. Blurting out that I kissed that guy, and the way I basically blamed Hardin for last night, when I know I wanted it just as much as he did. I just don't want to admit that to him, or to myself, not really. Thinking of him, and Molly together makes my stomach churn. If I don't eat something soon, I'll vomit. Not only from my hangover, but from Hardin's confession. Molly, of all people I despise her. I can picture her, with her stupid smirk, knowing that her sleeping with Hardin again would torture me. These thoughts circle around me like vultures until, finally, having pulled myself back from the abyss of a total breakdown, I dot the corners of my eyes with a tissue and grab my purse. In the elevator I nearly lose it again, but by the time I reach the bottom floor, I've regained control. Tessa. Trevor calls from the other side of the lobby. Good morning, he says as he hands me a cup of coffee. Thank you. Trevor, I'm so sorry for Hardin's behavior last night, I start. It's okay, really. He's a little intense I almost laugh, but the thought of doing this makes me nauseous again. Um, yeah intense, I mumble and take a sip of my coffee. He looks at his phone then tucks it back into his pocket. Kimberly and Christian will be down in a few minutes. He smiles. So is Hardin still here? No. And he won't be coming back. I try to sound like I could care less. Did you sleep well? I ask in attempt to change the subject. Yeah, but I was worried about you. Trevor's eyes travel to my neck, and I move my hair to cover, where my mark maybe is showing. Worried? Why? Can I ask you something? I don't want to upset you his tone is cautious, and it makes me a little nervous. Yeah go ahead. Has Hardin ever you know he hasn't ever hurt you, right? Trevor looks at the ground. What? We fight a lot, so, yeah, he hurts me all the time, I answer and take another gulp of the delicious coffee. He looks up at me sheepishly. I mean physically, he mutters. I snap my head to the side to look at him. He didn't just ask me, if Hardin puts his hands on me? I cringe at the thought. No. Of course not. He would never do that. I can tell by the look in Trevor's eyes, that he doesn't mean to offend me. 
I'm sorry he just seems so violent and angry. Hardin is angry, and sometimes violent, but he would never, ever hurt me like that. I feel an odd wave of anger toward Trevor for accusing Hardin of such a thing. He doesn't know Hardin but then again, neither do I, apparently. We stand in silence for a few minutes, and I ponder that until I spot Kimberly's blonde hair coming toward us. I really am sorry. I just think you should be treated much better, Trevor says quietly right before the others join us. I feel like shit. Absolute shit. Kimberly groans. Me too, my head is killing me, I agree as we all walk down a long corridor toward the conference center. You look so good, though. I, on the other hand, look like I just crawled out of bed, she says. You do not, Christian says and kisses her forehead. Thank you, babe, but your opinion is quite biased. She laughs and then rubs her temples. Trevor smiles and says, looks like we won't be going out tonight. Everyone readily agrees. When we arrive at the conference, I go straight to the breakfast bar and grab a bowl of granola. I eat it much faster than I should, and I can't seem to shake Hardin's words from my mind. I wish I had at least kissed him once more. No, I don't. I must still be drunk. The seminars go by quickly, and though Kimberly groans as the keynote speaker's voice booms far too loudly through the room, come a lunchtime break my headache is almost completely gone. Noon. Hardin would be back home by now, probably with Molly. He probably drove straight to her place just to spite me. Have they already slept together in our room? I mean, our old room? In the bed that was meant for us? When I remember the way he touched me and moaned my name last night, my body is replaced by hers. All I can see is Hardin and Molly. Molly and Hardin. Did you hear me? Trevor asks and takes a seat next to me. I smile apologetically. Sorry, I was out of it. I was wondering if you want to grab dinner tonight, since everyone's staying in. I look into his shining blue eyes, and when I don't immediately answer him, he stutters, I if you don't want to, that's okay too. Actually, I would love to, I tell him. Really? He breathes. I can tell he thought I would turn him down, especially after Hardin's behavior toward him. For the next four hours of talks, I let it warm my heart that Trevor would still want to take me out even after being threatened by my crazy ex. Thank goodness that's over. I need sleep, Kimberly groans as we get into the elevator. Looks like you're just not as young as you used to be, Christian teases, and she rolls her eyes and leans against his shoulder. Tessa, tomorrow we'll go shopping in the morning, while these two are at meetings, she says and closes her eyes. Which sounds great to me. As does a nice quiet dinner in Seattle with Trevor, in fact, it sounds amazing after my wild night with Hardin. I'm a little uneasy about my behavior this weekend already, kissing a stranger, basically forcing Hardin to have sex with me, and now going to dinner with a third guy. But the last of these is the most benign, and at least I know there won't be anything physical involved. Not for you, sure, but for Hardin and Molly my subconscious throws in. Man. She is getting on my nerves. At my door, Trevor stops and says, I'll come get you at 6.30, is that okay? I answer him with a smile and a nod, and go inside to the scene of the crime. I was going to try to take a small nap before my dinner with Trevor, but I end up taking another shower instead. I feel dirty from the events of last night, and I need to rewash heart and scent from my body. This time two weeks ago, I had thought everything would be so different right now with Hardin and me getting ready to visit his mother in London for Christmas. Now I don't even have anywhere to live, which prompts the thought that I need to call my mother back. She called me multiple times last night. After I get out of my shower, I start reapplying my makeup and hit her number. Hello, Teresa, she says in a clip tone. Hey, sorry I didn't call you back last night. I'm in Seattle for that publishing conference, and we were talking to clients later over dinner. Oh, that's right. Is he there? She asks, and I'm a little stunned she would even ask me that. No, why do you ask? I say as nonchalantly as possible. Because he called here last night trying to find out where you were. I don't appreciate you giving him this number, you know how I feel about him, Teresa. I didn't give him the number, I thought the two of you ended things, she interrupts. We did. 
I did. He probably just needed to know something about the apartment, or something, I lie. He must have been really desperate to get hold of me, if he called my mother's house. That thought hurts, and pleases me at the same time. Speaking of which, we can't get you into a dorm until Christmas break is over, but since you'll be off of work and school for the week, you can just come here. Oh okay, I agree. I don't want to spend my break at my mother's, but what choice do I have? I will see you Monday. And, Tessa, if you know what's good for you, you will stay far away from that boy, she says and hangs up. Spending a week at my mother's house will be hell. I don't know how I lived there for 18 years. Honestly, I never realized how bad she was until I got a taste of freedom. Maybe since Hardin is leaving the country Tuesday, I can stay in that motel for two more nights and go to the apartment while he's gone. As much as I don't want to ever go there again, it is still my name on the lease and it's not like you would ever know. Scrolling through my phone, I see that I have no new messages or calls from him, though I knew that I wouldn't. I can't believe he would sleep with Molly and throw it in my face like that. The worst part is that, if I hadn't blurted out that I kissed someone else, he would have never told me. Just like with the bet that started our relationship. And that means I just can't trust him. I finish getting myself ready, deciding upon a plain black dress. My days of woolen, pleated skirt seem so long ago. I apply another layer of concealer to my neck and wait for Trevor to come. True to his nature, he knocks on the door at exactly 6.30. Chapter 20. Harden. I stare at my father's massive house, unable to decide whether or not to go inside. Karen has decorated the outside with too many lights, mini Christmas trees, and what appear to be dancing reindeer. The blow-up Santa in the yard twists with the wind in a way that seems to mock me as I climb out of my car. Pieces of ripped-up airline tickets blow around the seat before I close the door. I will have to call and make sure I can get a credit for the unused tickets, otherwise I just blew two grand. I probably should just go alone and escape this dreadful state for a while, but for some reason, going home to London doesn't sound as appealing with Tessa not coming along. I'm grateful that my mum was okay with coming here instead. She actually seems excited to come to America. As I ring my father's doorbell, I try to come up with an excuse as to why the hell I am here. But before I can conjure something, Landon appears. Hey I say as he opens the door wider for me to come inside. Hey. He questions. I dig my hands into my pockets, unsure what to say or do. Tessa isn't here he says and walks toward the living room, indifferent to my presence. Yeah I know. She's in Seattle I say, following a few feet behind him. So I am well, I came to talk to you or my dad, I mean Ken. Or your mum I ramble on. Talk. About what? He takes the bookmark from the book he's holding and begins to read. I want to snatch the book from his hands and toss it into the fire, but that won't get me anywhere. Tessa I say quietly. My fingers fiddle with my lip ring as I wait for him to burst into laughter. He looks at me and closes his book. Let me get this straight Tessa doesn't want anything to do with you, so you're here to talk to me? Or your father, or even my mother? Yeah I guess God, he's irritating. This is embarrassing enough. Okay and what exactly do you think I can do for you? I, personally, don't think Tessa should ever speak to you again, and I honestly figured you would have moved on by now. Stop being a dick. I know I fucked up, but I love her, Landon. And I know she loves me. She's just hurt right now. Landon takes a deep breath and rubs his chin with his fingers. I don't know, Hardin. What you did is pretty unforgivable. You humiliated her, and she trusted you. I know I know. Fuck, don't you think I know that? He sighs. Well, seeing as you showed up here to ask for help, I'd say you get how messed up this whole situation is. So what do you think I should do? Not as her friend, but as. My you know, my father's stepson? Do you mean stepbrother? Dear stepbrother. He smiles. I roll my eyes and he laughs. Well, has she talked to you at all? He asks. Yeah I actually went to Seattle last night and she let me stay with her, I tell him. She what? He is clearly surprised. Yeah, she was drunk. I mean really drunk, 
and she practically made me fuck her. I notice his sour expression at my choice of words. Sorry she made me sleep with her. Well not made me, because I wanted to, I mean how could I say no she's just why am I even telling him this? He waves his hands in the air. Okay. Okay. I get it, jeez. So anyway, then this morning I said some shit that I shouldn't have said because she told me she kissed someone else. Tessa kissed someone, he asks, disbelief clear in his voice. Yes, yeah, some guy at a fucking nightclub. I groan. I don't want to think about that again. Wow. She really is pissed at you, he says. I know. What did you say to her this morning? I told her that I fucked Molly yesterday, I admit. Did you? Do you know have sex with Molly? No, God no. I shake my head. What the hell is going on here, that I am having some twisted heart to heart with Landon, of all people? Then why did you say that you did? Because she angered me. I shrug. She kissed someone else. Okay so you said, that you slept with Molly, who you know Tess despises, just to hurt her? Yeah good idea. He rolls his eyes. I wave his snarky movement away with a strong hand. Do you think she loves me? I ask, because I have to know. Landon snaps his head up, suddenly serious. I don't know he's a terrible liar. Tell me. Do you know her better than anyone, except me? She loves you. But because of how you betrayed her, she's convinced that you never loved her, Landon explains. It breaks my heart all over again. And I can't believe I'm asking for his help, but I need it. What can I do? Will you help me? I don't know he looks up at me with uncertainty but he must see my desperation. I guess I can try to talk to her. Her birthday is tomorrow, you know that, right? Yeah, of course I know that. Do you have plans with her? I ask him. He better not. No, she said she's going to stay at her mother's house. Her mother's house? Why? When did you talk to her? She texted me about two hours ago, and what else is she supposed to do? stay at a motel by herself on her birthday? I choose to ignore his last question. If I just kept my cool this morning, she might have possibly let me stay another night with her. Instead, she's still in Seattle with fucking Trevor. I hear footsteps coming down the stairs, and my father's body appears in the doorway a moment later. I thought I heard your voice yeah I came to talk to Landon, I lie. Well, it's half the truth. I was going to talk to whoever I saw first. I'm pathetic. He looks surprised. You did? Yeah. Um, also, mum is coming Tuesday morning, I tell him. For Christmas. That's great to hear. I know she misses you, he tells me. My first instinct is to think of a comeback, some remark about how shitty a father he is, but I simply don't feel like it. Well, I'll leave you two boys to talk, he says and walks back to the stairs. Oh, and Hardin, my father says when he's halfway up. Yeah? I'm glad you're here. Okay, I state. I don't know what else to say. My dad gives me a tight smile and continues up the stairs. This whole day is a fucking mess. My head hurts. Well I guess I'm going to go I say to Landon, and he nods. I'll do what I can, he promises as I walk to the door. Thanks. And when we both stand awkwardly in the doorway, I mumble, you know I'm not going to like hug you or some shit, right? As I walk out the door, I hear him laugh and shut the door. Chapter 21. Tessa. Big plans for Christmas? Trevor asks. I raise one finger to tell him to wait a moment while I savor this bite of ravioli. The food here is excellent and I'm no foodie but I imagine this has to be a five-star restaurant. Not really. Just going to my mother's house for the week. Do you? I'm doing some volunteer work at this shelter, actually. I don't really like to go back to Ohio. I have a few cousins and aunts, but since my mother passed, there isn't much there for me, he explains. Oh, Trevor, I'm sorry about your mother. But that's very kind of you, to volunteer. I smile sympathetically and take the last piece of ravioli into my mouth. It tastes as good as the first bite, but this revelation about Trevor makes me enjoy the food a little less while making me appreciate the dinner even more. Is that strange? We talk for a while longer, 
and enjoy an amazing flawless chocolate cake with a caramel topping for dessert. Afterward, when the waitress brings our check, Trevor pulls out his wallet. You aren't one of those women who demands to pay half of the bill, are you? He teases. Ha! Huh. I laugh. Maybe if we were at McDonald's. He chuckles but doesn't say anything. Harding would have made some stupid sarcastic remark about how my comment had set feminism back 50 years. Seeing that the light rain snow mix is resumed, Trevor tells me to wait inside while he calls a cab, which is very considerate of him. A few moments later he waves at me through the glass and I rush to get inside the warm cab. So what made you want to get into publishing, he asks as we head back to the hotel. Well, I love to read, it's all I do. It's the only thing that interests me, so it was just a natural career choice for me. I would love to become an author sometime in the future, but for now I love what I get to do at Vance, I tell him. He smiles. That's the same with me and accounting. Nothing else interests me either. I've known from a young age that I would do something with numbers. I despise math, but I just smile as he continues to talk about it. So do you like to read? I ask when he finishes, and we pull up at the hotel. Yeah, sort of. Mostly nonfiction. Oh why? I can't help but ask. He shrugs. I just don't really care for fiction. He hops out of the cab and holds a hand out for me. How can you not? I ask and take his hand to get out. The best thing about reading is to escape from your life, to be able to live hundreds or even thousands of different lives. Nonfiction doesn't have that power, it doesn't change you the way fiction does. Change you? He raises his brow. Yes, change you. If you aren't affected somehow, even in the slightest bit, you aren't reading the right book. As we pass through the lobby, I look at the great artwork on the walls. I would like to think that every novel I've read has become a part of me, created who I am, in a sense. You're very passionate. He laughs. Yeah, I guess I am, I say. Harding would agree with me, we would carry on this conversation for hours, possibly even days. We ride the elevator in relative silence, and when we step off, Trevor walks a half step behind me down the hall. I'm exhausted. And ready to go to sleep, even though it's only nine. Trevor smiles when we reach the door to my room. I had an amazing time with you tonight. Thank you dining with me. Thank you for the invitation. I smile back. I really enjoy spending time with you. We have a lot in common. I would love to see you again. He waits for my response, then clarifies, outside of the work setting. Yeah, I would like that, I say. He takes a step toward me, and I freeze. His hand reaches up and rests on my hip, and he leans into me. Um I don't really think this is the right time, I squeak. His cheeks flame in embarrassment, and I feel terribly guilty for declining his advance. Oh, I understand. I'm sorry. I sh shouldn't have he stutters. No, it's okay. I'm just not ready for that I explain, and he smiles. I understand. I'll let you go now. Good night, Tessa he says and walks away. As soon as I enter my room I let out a deep breath that I hadn't realized I was holding in. I step out of my shoes, debating whether or not to undress or just lie down. I'm tired, so tired. I decide to lie down while deciding, and within minutes I'm out. The entire next day with Kimberly flies by, and we do more gossiping than shopping. How was your night last night? She asks me. The woman filing my nails perks her head up nosily, and I smile at her. It was nice, Hardin and I went to dinner, I say, and Kimberly gasps. Hardin? Trevor. I meant Trevor. I would smack myself in the forehead if I weren't getting a manicure. Hmm, Kimberly teases me, and I roll my eyes. After our manicures we find a department store. We look at a lot of different shoes, and I see some stuff I like, but nothing I really want to buy. Kimberly buys several tops with an enthusiasm that tells me she really likes shopping. As we pass by the men's department, she pulls a navy button-up shirt off the rack and says, I think I'll get Christian a shirt as well. It's fun because he hates when I spend money on him. Doesn't he you know, have a lot? I ask, hoping not to sound too nosy. Oh yes. Shitloads. 
but I like to pay for myself when we go out. I'm not with him for his money, she says proudly. I'm glad that I met Kimberly. Aside from Landon, she's my only friend now. And I've never really had a lot of female friends, so this is a little new for me. Despite that, when Christian calls and arranges for the car to pick us up, I'm glad. I've had an amazing time here in Seattle, but it's been a horrible time as well. I sleep the entire drive back home and have them drop me back off at the motel. To my surprise, my car is there, parked where it had been before. I pay for two more nights and text my mother to tell her I'm sick and that I suspect it's food poisoning. She doesn't respond, so I turn on the television after getting into my pajamas. There is nothing, literally nothing, on and I would rather read anyway. I grab my car keys and go out to the car to get my bag. When I open my car door, something black catches my eye. And you read her? I pick it up and pull the small post-it note off the top. Happy birthday, Hardin, it reads. My heart swells, then tightens. I never liked the idea of portable reading devices. I prefer to hold a book in my hands. But after the conference this weekend, my opinion has slightly changed. Besides, it'll make it easier to carry around submissions for work without having to waste all that paper printing them out. Still, I grab Hardin's copy of Wuthering Heights off the floorboard and go back to my motel room. When I turn the device on, I immediately smile, then sob. On the home screen there is a tab named Tess, and when I tap it with my finger, a long list of every novel Hardin and I have discussed, bickered over, or even laughed about appears. Chapter 22. Tessa. When I finally wake up, it's two in the afternoon. I can't remember the last time I slept past 11, let alone later than lunch, but I forgive myself by taking into account that I stayed up until four reading and browsing through Hardin's wonderful gift. It is so thoughtful, too thoughtful, the best gift I've ever received. Grabbing my phone off the nightstand, I check my missed calls. Two from my mother, one from Landon. A few happy birthday messages clog my inbox, including one from Noah. I've never been that into birthdays, but I don't exactly love the idea of being alone today either. Well, I won't be alone. Catherine Earnshaw and Elizabeth Bennett are much better company than my mother. I order a crap load of Chinese food and stay in my pajamas the entire day. My mother is irate when I call her and tell her that I'm sick. I can tell that she doesn't believe me, but honestly, I don't care. It's my birthday, and I can do whatever I choose to do, and if what I choose to do is lie in bed with takeout and my new toy, then that's what I'll do. My fingers try to pull up Hardin's number a few times, but I stop them. No matter how wonderful his present was, he still slept with Molly. Whenever I think he couldn't possibly hurt me worse, he does. I begin to think about my dinner with Trevor on Saturday. Trevor, who is so nice and so charming. He says what he means, and he gives me compliments. He doesn't yell at me, or annoy me. He has never lied to me. I never have to guess what he's thinking, or how he's feeling. He's smart, educated, successful, and he volunteers at shelters on holidays. He's so perfect, compared to Hardin. The problem is that I shouldn't be comparing him to Hardin. Trevor is a little boring, yes and we don't share the same passion for novels that Hardin and I do, but we also don't share a damaged past. The most infuriating thing about Hardin is that I actually love his personality, rudeness and all. He's funny, witty, and can be so sweet when he wants to be. This gift is messing with my head, I need to remember what he has done to me. All the lies, the secrets, and most all the times he's fucked Molly. I text Landon back to thank him, and within seconds he responds asking for the address of my hotel. I want to tell him not to drive all the way here, but I also don't want to spend the remainder of my day completely alone. I don't get dressed, but I do slip on a bra under my shirt and read some more, waiting for Landon to arrive. An hour later, he knocks at the door, and when I open it, his familiar, warm smile makes me smile in return, and he pulls me into his arms. Happy birthday, Tessa, he says into my hair. Thank you, I say and hug him tighter. He lets me go and sits at the desk chair. Do you feel any older? No well, yes. 
I feel like I've aged 10 years in the last week. He gives me a small smile, but doesn't say anything. I ordered takeout, there's plenty left, if you want some, I offer. Turning, he grabs the white styrofoam container and a plastic fork from the desk. Thanks. So is this what you're doing all day? He teases. Sure is. I laugh and sit cross-legged on the bed. As he chews, Landon looks past me and raises a brow. Do you got any reader? I thought you hated them. Well I did, but now I kind of love them. I pick up the device and admire it. Thousands of books right at my fingertips. What could be better? I smile and tilt my head to the side. Well, nothing says happy birthday like buying yourself a gift, he says with his mouth full of rice. Actually, Hardin got it for me. He left it in my car. Oh. That was nice of him, he says with a peculiar tone. Yes, very. He even put all these wonderful novels on there, and I stop myself. So what do you think about it, he asks. It confuses me even more. He does these incredibly kind things sometimes, but he does the most hurtful things at the same time. He smiles and waggles the fork while he says, well, he does love you. Unfortunately, love doesn't always go hand in hand with common sense. I sigh. He doesn't know what love is. I start scrolling through the list of romantic novels and note that common sense is not something usually seen in any of these stories. He came to talk to me yesterday, he says, causing me to drop my gift onto the mattress. What? Yeah, I know. It surprised me too. He came looking for me, his dad, or even my mother, he says, and I shake my head. Why? To ask for help. Worry builds inside of me. Help? With what? Is he okay? Yeah well, no. He asked for help with you. He was completely distraught, Tessa. I mean, he came to his father's house, of all places. What did he say? I can't picture Hardin knocking on Ken's door to ask for relationship advice. That he loves you. That he wants me to help him persuade you to give him another chance. I wanted you to know. I don't want to keep things from you. I well I don't know what to say. I can't believe he came to you. To anyone, really. As much as I hate to admit it, he isn't the same hardened Scott that he was when I first met him. He even joked about hugging me. He laughs. I can't help but join him. He did not. I don't know how I feel about any of this, but that thought is definitely funny. When I stop laughing, I look at Landon and dare to ask, do you really believe that he loves me? Yes, I do. I don't know if I think you should forgive him, but if there's one thing I'm certain of, it's that he does love you. It's just that he lied to me, made me a joke, even after he told me he loved me, he still went and told them all what happened between us. Then, as soon as I begin to think I could possibly consider trying to move past that, he sleeps with Molly. Tears prick my eyes, and I grab the water bottle on the nightstand, and take a drink in an attempt to distract myself. He didn't sleep with her. I look over at him. Yes, he did. He told me he did. Landon puts the food container down and shakes his head. He just said that to hurt you. I know that's not much better, but you two are both known to fight fire with fire. Looking at Landon, the first thing I think is that Hardin is good. He even has his stepbrother believing his lies. The second thing I think is, but what if Hardin didn't actually sleep with Molly? Absent that, could I move toward forgiving him? I have my mind made up that I never would, but I can't seem to shake that boy. As if the universe is mocking me, my phone lights up with a message from Trevor that says happy birthday, beautiful. I send him a quick thanks, then say to Landon, I need more time. I don't know what to think. He nods. Fair enough. So what are you doing for Christmas? This. I gesture to the empty takeout box and e-reader. He grabs the remote. You aren't going to go home? This is more of a home than my mother's house, I say and try not to think about how pathetic I am. You can't just stay in a hotel alone on Christmas, Tessa. You should come to our place. I think my mother got you a few things before you know. My life went down the drain? I half laugh, and he nods playfully. Actually, I was thinking that since Hardin is leaving tomorrow, 
I would stay at the apartment just until I get into the dorms, which hopefully will be before he returns. If not, then I can always come back to this lovely abode. I can't help but joke about how ridiculous of a situation I'm in right now. Yeah you should do that, Landon says with his eyes focused on the television. You think? What if he shows up or something? He still doesn't take his eyes from the screen but agrees. He'll be in London, right? Yeah. You're right. My name is on the lease, after all. Landon and I watch television and talk about Dakota leaving for New York. He's considering transferring to Nayu next year, if she decides to stay out there. I'm happy for him, but I don't want him to leave Washington, not that I tell him that, of course. Landon stays until 9, and after he leaves I curl onto the bed and read until I fall asleep. The next morning I get ready for my return to the apartment. I can't believe I'm actually going back there, but I don't have many options. I don't want to take advantage of Landon, I definitely don't want to go to my mother's, and I'll run out of money if I stay here. I feel guilty for not going to my mother's, but I don't want to listen to her snide comments all week. I still may go there for Christmas, but not today. I have five days to decide. Once my hair is curled and my makeup is done, I put on a long-sleeved white shirt and dark jeans. I want to stay in my pajamas, but I need to go to the store to get some food for the next few days. If I eat whatever food Hardin has in the apartment, he'll know I was there. I pack my few belongings in my bags and hurry to my car, which, to my surprise, has been vacuumed and smells faintly of mint. Hardin. It starts to snow as I make my way to the grocery store. I buy enough food to last me until I decide what I want to do on Christmas. As I wait in line to check out, my mind wanders to what Hardin would have gotten me for Christmas. My birthday gift was so thoughtful, who knows what he'd have came up with. I hope it would be something simple, not expensive. Are you going to move up? A woman's voice barks from behind me. When I look up, the cashier is waiting impatiently with a scowl on her face. I didn't notice the line moving or disappearing in front of me. Sorry, I mumble, placing my groceries on the belt. My heart begins to race as I pull into the parking lot of the apartment. What if he hasn't left yet? It's only noon. I look frantically around the lot, and his car is gone. He probably drove himself to the airport and left his car there. Or Molly drove him. My subconscious doesn't know when to shut up. Once I determine that he isn't here, I park and grab the groceries. The snow is coming down harder and covers the cars around me in a thin layer. At least I'll be in the warm apartment soon. When I reach the door, I take one last breath before unlocking the door and stepping inside. I really love this place, it's so perfect for us for him or me, separately. When I open the cabinets and fridge, I'm surprised to find them stocked full of food. Hardin must have gone shopping in the last few days. I shove the food that I bought wherever it will fit and head back down to get my belongings. I can't stop thinking about what Landon said. I'm floored by the fact that Hardin would go to anyone for advice and that Landon professed to think Hardin loves me, a fact that I've known but buried and locked away for fear it would give me hope. If I allow myself to admit that he loves me, it will only make all of this worse. As soon as I get back into the apartment, I lock the door and put my bags in the room. I take out most of my clothes and hang them up so they won't be too wrinkled, but using the closet that was intended for Hardin and me only makes the knife inside of me twist once again. He only has a few pairs of black jeans hung up on the left side. I have to force myself not to hang up his t-shirts, they are always slightly wrinkled, although somehow he still manages to look perfect. My eyes travel to the black dress shirt hanging sloppily in the corner, the shirt he wore to the wedding. I hastily finish my task and walk away from the closet. I make myself some macaroni on the stove and turn on the television. I turn the volume up so that I can hear an old episode of Friends that I have seen at least 20 times and go into the kitchen. I speak along with the characters as I load the dishwasher, I hope Hardin hasn't noticed, but I can't stand to have dishes in the sink. I light a candle and wipe off the counters. Before I know it, I'm sweeping the floor, vacuuming the couch, and making the bed. Once the entire apartment is clean, I do a load of my laundry and fold the clothes Hardin had left in the dryer. 
Today is actually the most peaceful and calm day that I've had in the last week. That is, until I hear a set of voices and watch in slow motion as the lock turns. Shit. He's here, again. Why does he always show up at the apartment when I'm there? Hopefully it's just that he gave an extra key to one of his friends to check on the place, maybe it's said with a girl? Anyone but Hardin, please, let it be anyone but Hardin. A woman I've never seen before steps through the doorway, but I somehow instantly know who she is. The similarities are undeniable, and she is beautiful. Wow, Hardin, this flat is beautiful, she says, her accent just as thick as her son's. This. Is. Not. Happening. I'm going to look like a complete psychopath in front of Hardin's mom, with my food in the cabinets, my clothes in the washer, and the entire apartment cleaned from top to bottom. I stand completely frozen, and panicked as she looks up at me. Oh, my goodness. You must be Tessa. She smiles and rushes over to me. As Hardin steps through the doorway, he cocks his head to the side, and drops her floral print luggage from his hands. The surprise on his face is beyond evident. I tear my eyes from him, and focus on the woman coming toward me with open arms. I was so disappointed when Hardin said you'd be out of town this week, she gushes and wraps her arms around me. What a cheeky boy, fibbing just to try and surprise me. What? She puts her hands on my shoulders, and pulls me to look at her. Oh, you are so lovely, look at you. She squeals and hugs me again. I stay silent, and hug her once more. Hardin looks terrified and extremely caught off guard. Join the club. Chapter 23. Tessa. As his mother hugs me for the fourth time, Hardin finally mumbles, Mom, let's give her a little space. She's a bit shy. You're right, and I'm sorry, Tessa. I'm just so happy to finally meet you. Hardin has told me so much about you, she says warmly. I feel my cheeks flame as she steps back and nods in acknowledgement. I'm surprised she even knows that I exist, I would have figured he would have kept me a secret, as usual. It's okay, I managed to say through my horror. Mrs. Daniel smiles brightly and looks over at her son, who says, Mom, why don't you grab a drink of water in the kitchen for a minute? When she leaves, Hardin comes over to me with gentle movements. Can I, um talk to you in the bedroom for a mo moment, he stammers. I nod and glance toward the kitchen, before following him into the bedroom that we once shared. What the hell? I say quietly as I close the door. Hardin winces and sits on the bed. I know I'm sorry. I couldn't tell her what happened. I couldn't tell her what I did. Are you here you know, to stay? His voice holds more hope than I can bear. No oh. I sigh and run my fingers through my hair, a habit I picked up from Hardin, I suspect. Well, what am I supposed to do? I ask him. I don't know he says with a long sigh. I don't expect you to go along with it, or anything I just need a little time to tell her. I didn't know you would be here either, I thought you were going to London. I changed my mind, I didn't want to go without he trails off, and pain is evident in his eyes. Is there a reason, why you didn't tell her, that we aren't together? I don't know, if I want to hear his answer. She was just so happy, that I found someone I don't want to ruin that for her. I recall Ken telling me, that he never thought Hardin was capable of being in a relationship, and he was right. However, I do not want to ruin Hardin's mother's time here. I certainly don't say what I say next for his sake, okay. You can tell her whenever you are ready. Just don't tell her about the bet. I look down thinking that his mom knowing the details of how her son ruined his first and only love would surely hurt her. Really? You're okay with her thinking we're together? He sounds more surprised than he should be. When I nod, he lets out a deep breath. Thank you. I thought for sure you'd call me out right in front of her. I wouldn't do that, I say and mean it. No matter how angry I have ever been at Hardin, I wouldn't damage his relationship with his mother. I'll just finish my laundry, then go. I thought you weren't going to be here, so I figured I'd stay here instead of that motel. I shrug uncomfortably. We've been in the bedroom a little too long. You don't have anywhere to go? I could go to my mother's. I just really don't want to, I admit. The motel isn't bad, just a little expensive. This is the most civil conversation Hardin and I have had in the past week. I know you won't agree to stay here, but I could give you some money? I can tell he's afraid of my reaction to his offer. I don't need your money. I know, I just thought I would offer. He stares at floor. We better go back out there. I sigh and open the door. I'll be out in a second, he says softly. I don't like the idea of going out there to face his mother alone, but I can't stay in the small space of this bedroom with Hardin. I take a deep breath and leave the room. When I enter the kitchen, she looks over at me from where she stands at the sink. He isn't upset with me, is he? I didn't mean to crowd you. Her voice is so sweet. A total contrast to her son's. Oh no, of course not. He was just going over a few things about this week, I lie. 
I have always been a terrible liar, so I usually avoid it at all costs. Okay, good. I know how moody he can be. She smiles with such warmth that I can't help but smile back. I pour my own glass of water to calm my nerves, and she begins to speak as I take a sip. I still can't wrap my head around how beautiful you are. He told me you were the most beautiful girl he's ever seen, but I thought he was exaggerating. Less gracefully than the most beautiful girl a boy's ever seen would do, I spit my water back into my glass. Hardin said what? I want to ask her to verify that, but instead I just take another sip of water to mask my embarrassing reaction. She laughs. Honestly, I thought you would be covered in tattoos and have green hair or something. No, no tattoos for me. Or green hair. I laugh and feel my shoulders begin to relax. You're an English major like Hardin, right? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am? Call me Trish. I actually have an internship at Vance Publishing, so my class schedule is kind of weird. And right now we're on break. Vance? As in Christian Vance, she asks. I nod. Oh, I haven't seen Christian in at least 10 years. She looks down at the glass of water in my hands. Hardin and I actually live with him for a year after Kenwell, never mind, Hardin doesn't like when I spat off at the mouth. She chuckles nervously. I didn't know that Hardin and his mother stayed with Mr. Vance, but I knew that he was very close with him, closer than he would be if Christian were only his father's friend. I know about Ken, I say to Trish in an attempt to ease her discomfort, but then I immediately worry that I've implied I know about what happened to her, and I worry I've upset her. So when she replies, you do. I try to hedge a little and follow up with, yeah, Hardin has told me, but when Hardin appears in the kitchen I stop, and I have to admit I'm happy for the intrusion. He raises a brow. Hardin has told you what? My tension goes through the roof, but to my surprise, his mother covers, saying, nothing, son, just some girl talk, and walking over to him, and wrapping her arm around his waist. He pulls away slightly, as if out of instinct. She frowns, but I get the feeling this is a normal interaction between them. The dryer beeps, and I take that as my cue, to exit the room and finish up my laundry, so I can get out of here, fast. I pull my warm clothes from the dryer, and sit on the floor in the small laundry room to fold them. Hardin's mother is so sweet, and I find myself wishing that I could have met her under different circumstances. I don't feel anger toward Hardin, I have been angry long enough. I feel sadness, and a longing for what we could have been. After I'm done with my clothes, I go to the bedroom to repack my bags. I wish I hadn't hung any clothes in the closet, or put food in the kitchen. Do you need some help, dear? Trish asks me. Um, I was just getting my things ready to go to my mother's for the week, I reply, figuring I might as well just go there since the motel is expensive. You're leaving today? Right now? She frowns. Yeah I told her I would come for Christmas. For once I want Hardin, to come into the room, to help me talk my way out of this. Oh, I was hoping you would stay at least a night. Who knows when I'll be able to see you again, and I would love to get to know the young woman who my son has fallen in love with. And suddenly something in me wants to make this woman happy. I don't know if it's because of my mistake about saying I knew about Ken and her, or because of the way she covered for me in front of Hardin. But I do know I don't want to overthink this, so I silence my inner voice and just nod and say, okay. Really? You'll stay? Just one night, then you can go to your mum's house. You don't want to be driving through that snow anyway. She wraps her arms around me and hugs me for the fifth time today. At least she'll be here to be a buffer between Hardin and me. We can't fight if she's here. Well, I won't fight, at least. I know this is probably certainly the worst idea, but Trish is hard to say no to. Just like her son. Well, I'm going to take a quick shower. I had a long flight. She smiles broadly and heads out. I sink down onto the bed and close my eyes. This is going to be the most awkward, painful 24 hours of my life. No matter what I do, I always seem to end up back where I started, with him. After a few minutes I open my eyes to find Hardin standing in front of the closet with his back to me. Sorry, I didn't mean to bother you, he says when he turns back around. I sit up. He is being so strange, apologizing every other word. I see that you clean the apartment, he says softly. Yeah I couldn't help it. I smile, and so does he. Hardin, I told your mom that I would stay tonight. Only tonight, but if that's not okay, I'll go. I just felt bad because she's so nice, and I couldn't say no, but if that makes you uncomfort Tessa, it's fine he says quickly, but then his voice shakes when he adds, I want you to stay. I don't know what to say, and I don't understand this strange turn of events. I want to thank him for the present, but there is just too much going on inside of my head. Did you have a nice birthday yesterday? He asks. Oh, yeah. Landon came by. 
Oh but then we hear his mother in the living room, and he moves to go. He stops before walking through the door and turns to me. I don't know how I'm supposed to act. I sigh. Me either. At that, he nods, and we both get up to join his mother in the other room. Chapter 24. Tessa. When Hardin and I enter the living room, his mother is sitting on the couch with her wet hair pulled into a bun. She looks so young for her age, so stunning. We should rent some movies, and I'll make dinner for all of us, she exclaims. Don't you miss my cooking, Dumbling? Hardin rolls his eyes and shrugs. Sure. Best cook ever. This couldn't possibly be more awkward. Hey. I'm not that bad. She laughs. And I think you just talked yourself into being chef tonight. I shift uncomfortably, unsure how to behave around Hardin, unless we're together or fighting. This is an odd place for us, though I suddenly realize this is a pattern of ours, Karen and Ken had been under the impression that we were dating before we actually were. Can you cook, Tessa? Trish asks, breaking my thoughts. Or is it Hardin too? Um, we both do. Maybe more preparing than cooking, really, I answer. I'm glad to hear that you're taking care of my boy, and this apartment is so nice too. I suspect Tessa does the cleaning, she teases. I'm not taking care of her boy, since that's what he's missing out on for hurting me the way he did. Yeah he's a slob, I answer. Hardin looks down at me with a small smile playing on his lips. I'm not a slob, she's just too clean. I roll my eyes. He's a slob, Trish and I say in unison. Are we going to watch a movie, or pick on me all night? Hardin is pouting. I sit down before Hardin does, so I don't have to make the uncomfortable decision about where to sit. I can see him eyeing the couch in me, silently deciding what to do. After a moment, he sits right next to me, so I feel the familiar heat from his proximity. What do you want to watch, his mother asks us. It doesn't matter, Hardin replies. You can choose. I try to soften his answer. She smiles at me, before choosing 50 First Dates, a movie I'm sure Hardin will hate. And right on cue, Hardin groans as it begins. This movie is old as shit. S-H-H-H, I say, and he huffs but stays quiet. I catch him staring at me several times, while Trish and I laugh and sigh along with the movie. I'm actually enjoying myself, and for a few moments I almost forget everything that has happened between Hardin and me. It's hard not to lean into Hardin, not to touch his hands, not to move his hair, when it falls onto his forehead. I'm hungry, he mumbles when the movie ends. Why don't you and Tessa cook, since I had such a long flight? Trish smiles. You're really milking this long flight thing, aren't you?" he says to her. She nods with a wry smile that I've seen on Hardin's face a few times. I can cook, it's okay, I offer and stand up. I walk into the kitchen and lean against the counter. I grip the edges of the marble countertop harder than necessary, trying to catch my breath. I don't know how long I can do this, pretend that Hardin didn't destroy everything, pretend that I love him. I do love him, I am miserably in love with him. The problem is not my lack of feelings toward this moody, egotistical boy. The problem is that I've given him so many chances, always dismissing the hateful things that he says and does. But this time it's too much. Hardin, be a gentleman and help her, I hear Trish say, and I rush over to the freezer to pretend like I wasn't having a mini breakdown. Um I can help? His voice carries through the small kitchen. Okay I answer. Popsicles, he asks, and I look at the object in my hands. I had meant to grab chicken, but I was distracted. Yeah. Everyone likes popsicles, right? I say, and he smiles, revealing those evil dimples of his. I can do this. I can be around Hardin. I can be nice to him, and we can get along. You should make that chicken pasta that you made for me, I suggest. His green eyes focus on me. That's what you want to eat? Yes. If it's not too much trouble. Of course not. You're being so weird today, I whisper so our house guest doesn't hear. No, I'm not. He shrugs and steps toward me. My heart begins to race as he leans in. As I move to step away, he grabs the door to the freezer and pulls it open. I thought he was going to kiss me. What the hell is wrong with me? We cook dinner in almost complete silence, neither of us knowing what to say. My eyes watching him the entire time, the way his long fingers curl around the base of the knife to chop the chicken and the vegetables, the way he closes his eyes when the steam from the boiling water hits his face, the way his tongue swipes the corners of his mouth when he tastes the sauce. I know that observing him like this isn't conducive to being impartial or healthy in any way, but I can't help it. I'll set the table while you tell your mom it's ready, I say when it's finally done. What? I'll just call her. No, that's rude. Just go get her, I say. He rolls his eyes but obeys anyway, only to return seconds later, alone. She's asleep, he tells me. I heard him, but I still ask, what? Yeah, 
She's passed out on the couch. Should I just wake her up? No, she had a long day. I'll put some food away for her so, whenever she gets up she can eat. It's sort of late anyway. It's eight. Yeah, that's late. I guess. His voice is flat. What is with you? I know this is uncomfortable and all, but you are being so weird, I say as I put food on two plates without thinking. Thanks. He says and grabs one, before sitting down at the table. I grab a fork from the drawer, and opt to stand at the counter to eat. Are you going to tell me? Tell you what? He grabs a forkful of chicken and digs in. Why you're being so quiet and nice. It's weird. He takes a moment, to chew then swallow before he answers. I just don't want to say the wrong thing. Oh is all I can think to say. Well, that's not what I expected to hear. He turns the tables on me then. So why are you being so nice and weird? Because your mother is here and what happened, happened, there's nothing I can do to change it. I can't hold on to that anger forever. I lean against the counter on my elbow. So what does that mean? Nothing. I'm just saying that I want to be civil and not fight anymore. It doesn't change anything between us. I bite my cheek to keep my eyes from tearing up. Instead of saying anything, Hardin stands up and throws his plate into the sink. The porcelain splits down the middle with a loud crack that causes me to jump. Hardin doesn't flinch or even turn back around as he stalks off to the bedroom. I peer into the living room to make sure that his impulsive behavior hasn't woken up his mother. Fortunately, she's still asleep, her mouth slightly open in a way that makes her resemblance to her son all the stronger. As usual, I'm left to clean up the mess that Hardin made. I load the dishwasher and put away the leftovers before wiping down the counter. I'm exhausted, mentally more than physically, but I need to take a shower and go to bed. But where the hell am I going to sleep? Hardin is in the bedroom and Trish is on the couch. Maybe I should just drive back to the motel. I turn the heat up a little and switch off the light in the living room. When I walk into the bedroom to get my pajamas, Hardin is sitting on the edge of the bed, his elbows on his knees and his head in his hands. He doesn't look up, so I grab a pair of shorts and a t-shirt and panties from my bag before exiting the room. As I hit the doorway, I hear what sounds like a muffled sob. Is Hardin crying? He isn't. He couldn't be. On the off chance that he is, I can't leave the room. I pad back to the bed and stand in front of him. Hardin? I say quietly and try to remove his hands from his face. He resists, but I pull harder. Look at me, I beg. The breath is knocked out of me when he does. His eyes are bloodshot, and his cheeks are soaked with tears. I try to take his hands in mine, but he jerks away. Just go, Tessa, he says. I've heard him say that too many times. No, I say and kneel down between his open legs. He wipes his eyes with the back of his hands. This was a bad idea. I'm going to tell my mom in the morning. You don't have to. I've seen him let out a few tears before, but never full on, body shaking, tears streaming down his face crying. Yeah, I do. This is torture for me to have you so close but so far. It's the worst possible punishment. Not that I don't deserve it, because I know I do, but it's too much, he sobs. Even for me. He draws in a deep, desperate breath. When you agreed to stay I thought that maybe maybe you still cared for me the way I do for you. But I see it, Tess, I see the way you look at me now. I see the pain I've caused. I see the change in you because of me. I know that I did this, but it still kills me to have you slip through my fingers. The tears come much faster now, falling against his black t-shirt. I want to say something, anything, to make this stop. To make his pain go away. But where was he, when I was crying myself to sleep night after night? Do you want me to go? I ask, and he nods. His rejection hurts, even now. I know I shouldn't be here, we shouldn't be doing this, but I need more. I need more time with him. Even dangerous, painful time is better than no time. I wish I didn't love him, that I had never met him. But I did. And I do love him. Okay. I swallow and stand up. His hand grips my wrist to stop me. I'm sorry. For everything, for hurting you, for everything, he says, goodbye thick in his tone. As much as I resist this, I know deep down that I'm not ready for him to give up on me. On the other hand, I'm not ready to easily forgive him either. I've been in a constant state of confusion for days, but today takes the cake. I, I stop myself. What? 
I don't want to go, I say so low, that I'm not sure he even heard me. What, he asks again. I don't want to go. I know I should, but I don't want to. Not tonight at least. I swear I can see the pieces of the broken man in front of me slowly come back together, one by one. It's a beautiful sight, but terrifying deep in my soul too. What does this mean? I don't know what it means, but I'm not ready to find out either, I say, hoping to be able to get at this feeling by talking about it. Hardin looks at me blankly, his earlier sobs nowhere to be found. Robotically, he wipes his face with his shirt and says, okay. You can sleep on the bed, I'll take the floor. As he grabs two pillows and the throw blanket from the bed, my mind can't help but entertain the thought that maybe, just maybe, all those tears were for show. Still, somehow I know that they couldn't have been. Chapter 25. Tessa. Tucked like I am under our comforter, the thought that keeps going through my mind is that I never, ever would have thought I'd witness anything like that from Hardin. He was so raw, so vulnerable, as his body shook with tears. I feel like the dynamic between Hardin and me is constantly shifting, so that one of us is always gaining an upper hand over the other. Right now, I would be the one in control. But I don't want to be. And I don't like this dynamic. Love shouldn't be such a battle. Besides, I don't trust myself to be in control of what happens between us. Up until a few hours ago I had it all figured out, but now, after seeing him so shaken up, my mind is muddled, and my thoughts clouded. Even in the darkness, I can feel Hardin's eyes on me. When I let out the breath I realized I was holding, he quickly asks, do you want me to turn the television on? No. If you want to, you can, but I'm okay, I answer. I wish that I had grabbed my e-reader, so I could read until I fell asleep. Maybe observing the ruination of Catherine and Heathcliff's lives would make mine seem easier, less traumatic. Catherine spent her whole life trying to fight her love for that man, on and off until the day she begged for his forgiveness and claimed she could not live without him, only to die hours later. I could live without Hardin, couldn't I? I won't spend my entire life fighting this. This is only temporary, right? We won't bring ourselves and others misery because of our stubbornness and hard heads, right? I'm bothered by the uncertainty of this parallel, especially since it means I start comparing Trevor to Edgar. I don't know how to feel about this. It's awkward. Tess, my very own Heathcliff calls, resting me away from my thoughts. Yeah. I croak. I didn't fuck sleep with Molly, he says, as if correcting his foul language makes the statement any less shocking. I stay silent, partly stunned by him talking about this, partly because I want to believe him. But I can't allow myself to forget that he's a master of deception. I swear it, he adds. Oh, well, if he swears it, why did you say that, then? I ask harshly. To hurt you. I was just so mad because you said you kissed someone, so I just said the thing that I knew would hurt you the most. I can't see Hardin, but somehow I know that he's lying on his back, his arms crossed, hands under his head, staring at the ceiling. Did you really kiss someone? He asks before I can respond. Yeah, I admit. But when I hear the suction of a deep breath, I try to soften the blow by adding, only once. Why? His voice is cool yet heated. It's a strange sound. I honestly have no idea I was mad because of how you were acting on the phone, and I had way too much to drink. So I danced with this guy, and he kissed me. You danced with him? Danced how? He asks. I roll my eyes at Hardin's needing to know every detail of what I do, even when we aren't together. You don't want me to answer that. His words thicken the air between us again. Yes, I do. Hardin, we just danced like people do at a club. Then he kissed me and tried to get me to go home with him. I stare at the blades on the ceiling fan. I know that, if we keep talking about this, they will eventually be forced to stop, unable to cut through the tension. I try to change the subject. Thank you for the ear eater. It was very thoughtful. He tried to get you to go home with him? Did you? I hear him shuffling, giving me an indication that he's now sitting up. I remain flat against the mattress. Do you even have to ask that? Do you know I would never do that, I snap. Well, I never thought you would be kissing, 
and dancing at a club either, he barks. After a few beats of silence I speak. I don't think you want to get started on the unexpected. The blankets shuffle again, and I can feel him right next to me. That voice is right next to me. Tell me, please tell me, that. You didn't. He sits down on the bed next to me, and I move away from him. You know I didn't. I saw you later that night. I need to hear you say it. His voice is harsh but pleading. Say that you only kissed him once, and you haven't spoken to him since. I only kissed him once, and I haven't spoken to him since, I repeat, only because I know he desperately needs to hear the words. I keep my eyes focused on the swirl of ink poking out from the low collar of his shirt. Having him on the bed, soothes me and burns me all at once. I can't stand the internal battle I'm stuck in the middle of. Is there anything else I should know? He asks softly. No, I lie. I am not telling him about the date with Trevor. Nothing happened and it's none of Hardin's business. I like Trevor, and I want to keep him safe from the time bomb that is Hardin. You sure? Hardin I don't really think you're in the position to be hounding me, I say and look into his eyes. I can't help it. I know, he surprises me by saying. When he moves off of the bed, I try to ignore the emptiness that takes me over 